Gage for five minutes. Admiral Harris, it's great to have you back before the committee. Few people know China's capabilities like you do. When you saw this balloon traversing the continent of North America, what concerned you most? Yeah, thanks, uh, Congressman. Good to see you again. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the most concern was what was it doing and what information is it getting? And is it itself dangerous? I mean, we don't know. I mean, General Van Herc talked about the possibility that there were explosives on the, uh, uh, on the balloon uh, and, and, and all of that. Uh, General Hurtling talked about the, uh, whether the, the balloon was sent up as a ploy uh, uh, to, to see what we would do. Uh, and I think that your comments uh, about it, uh, in, the, in the media at least, uh, were some of the, the, the best uh, that I read. And that is, does it give, would shooting it down give China a sort of pretext for them to do the same thing? We just don't know at the time that it happened. Fortunately, we had time because, I mean, let's face it, it's a balloon. So we had time to, to think about it, to consider it, to weigh it, and I think most importantly, perhaps not most importantly, but certainly importantly, it gave China a chance to address the issue diplomatically, which they failed to do to, to no surprise. So ultimately, the decision was made to shoot it down and did so uh, in a way that was safe for uh, people and property well, and well, in a way that we could collect the information. Uh, uh, it's only in 47 feet of water. In our we'll limited know. time, let's, let's bifurcate that, the danger and then the transmission of information. We have the capability to block the transmission of information from the balloon back to China, don't we? We do. And in this type of an environment, do you think it's probably likely that we did that? I, I would only guess, but I think General Van Herc said that. Uh, well, you can't see any reason did. why we wouldn't do that. Right. Uh, and, and when it comes to the, the danger yeah. that the balloon poses, are you aware of capability with this type of a balloon system to birth sensors or drones or other hardware or assets? Uh, I'm not, but that's, that's why it's so important to, to try to collect up all the pieces of this thing to understand. I mean, this thing is huge, right? I mean, it's, the balloon itself is bigger, bigger than this room. Uh, it's, it's three or 4,000 pounds of equipment. A couple of buses, uh, I think, is, the, is, is what has been said. So, yeah, I just wonder, like, why would the Chinese use this balloon rather than a satellite system for surveillance? And one thing that presumably a, a satellite could not do yeah. would be birth other sensors or drones. And so just it, so that it, it gives Americans comfort, your testimony here is during your time in command, you never were aware of or briefed on a capability that the Chinese had to use a balloon system like that for that type of a... Of a proliferation of other hardware or assets. That's correct. That, and again, that's why it's so important to collect this, collect as much of the balloon pieces that we can uh, to understand uh, exactly what we're dealing with. Here. And while it could very well be also that maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's just me speculating here because I'm, I'm under pressure and I'm, I'm liable to blurt out the truth. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it could very well be that maybe we've overestimated the capability of uh, Chinese satellites in low Earth orbit. Well, and, and you've shared with me that we have the capability to block any transmission of information from the balloon. And as while you weren't in the Situation Room while this decision was being made, as you join us today, you can't assess a circumstance in which we would have ever allowed information right. to be transmitted. I, I would back. think. And it uh, sort of begs the question, was this a big psyop? Yeah. Was, the, was this been. an effort by China to see how we would react to something like this that might not have had, you know, the danger that we spoke of because you were not aware of that capability and then also didn't have an intelligence uh, collection function. And so, you know, to, um, to others, it may have been an effort to try to see how we would react, how we wouldn't react, and then to try to use that to inform their decision making. In my limited time I have left with the Admiral, in the broadest sense, if, I, if we had $100 billion to dedicate to the China scenario, in which domain would that be the smartest investment? Uh, it, it would not be in counter balloon warfare. <laughs> uh, I think I would, it, I would agree. You know, and, and my, and would it be space? Would it be cyber? I think it would be cyber. Warfare? I think it would be cyber uh, and space. If, if and and what equate. dividends? If we made a one hundred billion dollar investment in cyber, what could the American people expect regarding the enhancement to their safety? I, I think we could be assured then that we wouldn't have intrusions, uh, intentional or, or otherwise, from any number of actors 
including Chinese. Well, assured of no intrusions from the Chinese sounds to me like a lot better than sending $100 billion to Ukraine, but that'll be something like we'll assess as a team. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yield back. Chair. Recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Mr. Williams, wouldn't the American people feel like this government wasn't so weaponized against them if there wasn't such a revolving door between Department of Justice senior officials and lobbying? I, I, I don't quite follow the premise of your question, sir. Well, it's pretty easy. There's a revolving door between senior officials at the DOJ and the lobbying profession. Do you think that that gives the public more or less trust? There are rules governing what employment, and this is based on my understanding, I've been government for 15 years, governing what post-government employment can be. One, what individuals' actions can be once they're employed elsewhere, but also what they're allowed I mean, to do. Lobbying is influence peddling, and you are the principal at the Rabin Group, which is a lobbying firm. And I would observe the reporting of Project Veritas, where Jordan Tristan Walker, who's a director of research and development, said on a recording, one of the things we're exploring is like, why don't we just manipulate COVID ourselves, mutate COVID via directed evolution? Pfizer is a revolving door for all government officials. It's pretty good for industry, to be honest. It's bad for everyone else in America. Pfizer is one of the clients of the lobbying firm that you're a principal of, isn't it? I do not represent Pfizer. I do not know, You're, sir. you're a principal of the Rabin Group, right? No, I, that, that is correct. I, I okay, mean, uh, I Mr. Chairman, so, I seek yeah. unanimous consent to enter into the record the clients of the Rabin, Rabin sure. Group, which include Pfizer. Without objection. Not just Pfizer, but Google as well. And in response to the Twitter files, we saw a statement come from the FBI where they said correspondence between the FBI and Twitter show nothing more than examples of our traditional, long-standing, and ongoing federal government and private sector engagements. Are there such engagements between the FBI and Google? When you say such engagements, sir, I don't quite Does Google follow. engage with the FBI, Mr. Williams? I don't work for either Google or the FBI, well, sir, I, so Gosh, I I'd, I'd have to again point you to your own client list that you advertise on your own website, which includes Google. Does it surprise you that at the Raven Group's website, Pfizer and Google are clients? It does not surprise me, sir, no. I, the the Soros-funded Open Society is one of the clients as well. Does that surprise you? Uh, sir, I don't have our client list in front of me right now. I will, uh, assuming that's what it says, I will, I will take your word for it. Yeah, I would think that maybe one of the legislative initiatives we could pursue would be to tighten this revolving door that folks at Pfizer and folks at Big Tech seem to freely acknowledge in which you seem to be the incarnate of the revolving door. Uh, Mr. Baker and Ms. Parker, Wait, sorry, I, want Mr. Assure you both that that I want to assure you both that we time. come not to trash the FBI, but to rescue the FBI well from political capture. And it seems as though that political capture was really enhanced when Robert Mueller took a lot of the authority and power away from the field offices all over our country and centralized that power. Uh, uh, Mr. Baker, do you believe that through legislation, we might be able to restore the system of office origin where, where events occur, people are able to conduct investigations in the absence of the influences of Washington, D.C.? There's no doubt Congress can be an advocate. You're doing a lot of good by having these hearings, this panel. Uh, a lot of these things, though, have to be done internally by the DOJ and the FBI. But there's absolutely a role for Congress, uh, looking at the abuses of Pfizer for one, the abuses of the unmasking for another, the abuses of the indirect targeting, which actually the CIA and the NSA do rather than the FBI. But these are all things Congress can legislate solutions too. And it seems as though those abuses become more acute the greater they have a geographic proximity to Washington, D.C. Seems we don't see these abuses with the brave FBI agents like Ms. Parker, who I'm very grateful served my fellow Floridians in the Miami field office. Ms. Parker, if, if we got the decision making more out of Washington, D.C. and into the hands of our field offices where we have so many patriotic and brave FBI officials, do you think we'd be able to escape this political capture that quite literally drove you out of the bureau? I think that's absolutely critical at this point in our, um, in our uh, American history. When I mentioned in the um, opening statement is, is if there are two FBI's, we in the FBI see it as 
the field offices, the standard rank and file. We are typically the agents who just came to the FBI to serve the country, um, protect American citizens, fight crime. We have no interest in politics. We really have no interest in promoting many times. And then FBI, too, is kind of more um, individuals that are um, at, at the headquarters level and um, sometimes well, it seems executive as though, roles. It seems as though that politics isn't out in the field offices. It's here in Washington, D.C., and that's precisely what we ought to deconstruct legislatively. I thank the witnesses, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Next up from Florida's first congressional district, a humble country lawyer who represents the Blue Angels, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the frustrations that we've had on the Armed Services Committee has been the gestation period from R&D to actually getting these cyber capabilities to our cyber warriors. And one of the things that's been presented to us as a way to bridge that long gestation period is the Defense Innovation Unit, the DIU. I was wondering if any of you had a perspective on how we ought to think about resourcing that and whether or not that's a way to get capabilities into the hands of cyber warriors faster. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, I do have a lot of experience at the DIU, both in government and out of government, uh, and I think that it does a terrific job for what it was established to do. Uh, and there are many other organizations focused on similarly kind of reducing the barriers to entry to get these kinds of more mature, kind of commercially developed uh, advanced capabilities into the Department of Defense. Um, I am all in favor of that, and I think anything that you can do to encourage that is good. What I would contend is that the bigger challenge uh, that, I would, that I would recommend the committee focus on is what happens after that. Uh, so when you reduce these barriers and you bring in small companies doing small things on small contracts for small amounts of money, uh, and you have hundreds of them, that's good. Um, now we need to go through and sort of systematically determine, you know, what is the best 10% uh, that needs to get, you know, large-scale production contracts to really make the kind of impact at scale that you're talking about. That apparatus or process does not exist in the department, um, and it's something that I would say is, is ripe for congressional oversight. Uh, I, I also go ahead, Adam Montgomery. If you had a perspective, no, I agree, and I, I am disappointed that Mike Brown left leadership of the DIU. I think his personal leadership had a lot to do with its success. So we'll have to see what what happens over time with that. Sometimes these small organizations can be very personality driven. It's good feedback. Uh, another concern I have in the cybersphere is the threat presented by these DJI drones. I've seen report after report from the Department of Homeland Security about the capabilities of these drones to be able to collect intelligence, to transmit intelligence, and, and ultimately to impair our, our cyber defense infrastructure. How do you think we ought to think about these DJI drones? I'll step in there, and I'll tell you, I was sorely disappointed that the American Security Drones Act dropped out of the last uh, National Defense Authorization Act. It makes no sense that the Department of Defense recognized that these drones are unacceptable in our system and remove them and replace them at some cost. Yet other federal agencies, intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies are not being compelled to follow suit. Uh, we know that these systems can communicate back uh, to, uh, to, their, uh, to the servers of their, host, of their host company in China. And we know that those companies can be compelled by the Chinese intelligence agencies to provide information. If you'd asked me as the J3 at Paycom, what would be my dream scenario when I woke up in the morning? It would be that U.S. drones were flying up and down all Chinese critical infrastructure every night and sending photos and information back to my team so that I could easily target. Well, U.S. critical infrastructure companies are buying DJI and other Chinese drones at about 80% of market share, and they're flying up and down our pipelines, our electrical power grids, our water systems, and they have the opportunity to transmit that information, and the Chinese have the, the intelligence has the opportunity to request it. And oftentimes, are these DJI drones not provided to our local and state law enforcement agencies at incredibly low cost? They, they are, and um, in both Florida, as I'm sure you've experienced, in Texas, we've seen that, and, uh, and in Norfolk and San Diego. And I can't imagine what a Chinese drone would detect flying, uh, flying in uh, the San Diego and Norfolk areas, um, you know, on a daily basis while doing legitimate law enforcement work, but also grabbing a good picture of everyone who's at, at every pier. Yeah, it, it, uh, it is deeply frustrating to think that our own law enforcement agencies are 
you know, almost uh, being utilized, essentially being utilized by the Chinese Communist Party to engage in this activity. So, Mr. Chairman, I know you've got a, a lot of hats you wear on this subcommittee and also working to chair the Select Committee on China. And I would suggest that the National Defense Authorization Act would be a wonderful place to nestle some drone doctrine for uh, defense against this uh, Chinese capability. Appreciate the testimony. And I'm still waiting to see who in Washington is defending these drones. I don't know why that legislation dropped out of the NDAA. Uh, maybe they'll, they'll perk up at some time. Well, they actually used, they had a pretty robust lobbying effort that used law enforcement officials, if memory serves, to go into members' office and well, say. Now we know better. We need, yeah. I thank the gentleman. Uh, now I yield to the gentleman from Florida, my friend, Mr. Gates. Mr. Chairman, I observe that the people of Yuma are good folks, and they deserve a lot better from the federal government than they have been getting. And whether or not they'll get it depends heavily on the House of Representatives, and particularly this group, and whether or not we will fight for them. We don't have a single Democrat that we could even convince to come to this briefing to get evidence from these experts. You think we're going to get President Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer to pass legislation without a fight, without demanding that it go in must-pass bills, and we have to use every bit of leverage, or this is a deeply unserious exercise. Now, Dr. Trenchell, about one in four of the migrants who use birthing services at your hospital need neonatal intensive care unit services. Nick, you, right? That is true, yes. And, and that rate, one in four, is way higher than with the non-migrant population, right? Very much higher, You've got about 20 beds at any given time. Correct. And they fill up sometimes, don't they? Yes, and they so do. And so when you have those beds that are full up because of the pressure of these migrant communities, where do you have to send the residents of Yuma when they have a baby that needs NICU? We would have to fly them to Phoenix or another venue. And that's 170 miles away. Yes, it is. There, there, is, there, is, there are few prayers that I have ever seen more sincere and deeper than the prayers of parents when their little babies are at the NICU. And for all the folks on the left who want to lecture to us about hu how humane an open border is, there is nothing humane about putting a parent on a 170-mile journey when they need NICU services. Uh, Supervisor Lyons, we hear Secretary Mayorkas come to us all the time on the Judiciary Committee and testify that the most important partnerships above all else for the Department of Homeland Security are the partnerships with local officials. We hear it time and again. And so here is my simple question for you. Has Secretary Mayorkas ever lied to you? Yes. And what was the substance of that lie? So the mayor and I had the opportunity to uh, visit with Secretary Mayorkas and the Yuma sector chief, as well as the, sec the chief of the entire Border Patrol at sector headquarters almost a year ago. And during that meeting, he committed to, after reviewing the border, both from the ground and the air, to specifically address, quote unquote, nine of the 11 Yuma gaps. And, and how many of those gaps have been addressed? To date so far? None. We see infrastructure on two, and yet uh, they will not deter anyone. Yeah. This is my fourth time here with you. I think yes, if sir. I come any more often, I'm going to be eligible to vote in you, McKenna. Thank you for, co <laughs> thank but, you for coming back, but, Matt. But, but in, in these District circumstances, it seems as though it's not a great mystery where the pressure points are, where we have gaps in the wall, and where we have recalcitrant tribes. And so in, in those circumstances, should we observe that this is – um, a, a lack of capability or a lack of will to go and plug those holes? A lack of will. We've followed up multiple times as well as uh, Yuma Sector uh, Border Patrol uh, staff and with undersecretaries, and we were told time and time again that they were issuing contracts, that we would have it no later than June of last year, then no later than September, then no later than November. Every time it kept getting pushed out. While so would a reasonable person observe that this is on purpose? Uh, my wife says I'm not a very patient person, but I was patient every time that they that I called, um, and they continued to push this process out. It's not well, reasonable. Well, the American people are losing their patience. We ought to be losing ours. And while we greatly appreciate the three of you being here to answer our questions, the day will come soon when Secretary Mayorkas has to come and answer our questions. And to my colleagues, if he'll lie 
to Mr. Lyons and lie to the community here, then he will lie to us and he will lie to the American people. And that's why I'm very proud to co-sponsor Representative Biggs' articles of impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas, because this is not a lack of ability. It is a lack of will. Mr. Lyons, I'll give you the last word. Mr. Gates, thank you very much. And uh, to what Mr. McClintock, McClintock was saying, uh, as far as the cartel violence, over the last 14 months, uh, the sheriff and I have been made aware of over 200 assassinations in San Luis Rio, Colorado, where the cartels are targeting law enforcement. This last weekend, we had another officer shot and then retribution the following night. So when you talk about that violence, it's here at our border. They are in control, and we want to take our control, our border control back. And we need a, an administration that has the will to secure our borders, and that's what we're asking you to do. And I thank you very much for being here. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. April 2022, uh, President Biden is describing the supplemental funding that we're providing to Ukraine. He says, quote, it's also going to help schools and hospitals open. It's going to allow pensions and social support to be paid to the Ukrainian people so they have something, something in their pocket. So do, it, it's, help me understand how U.S. taxpayers paying for pensions in Ukraine is, is a good idea for our country. Uh, I would defer you to other parts of our government. The Department of Defense doesn't have a role in, in uh, pensions in Ukraine. You're a senior Biden administration official. The president said that it's really important that we keep funding the pensions in Ukraine. I would observe that the U.S. Census Bureau says that in 2022, the U.S. pension shortfall is $1.4 trillion. So while we have a corrupt Ukrainian government while we have our watchdog here who can't say that we followed the law on in-use monitoring, we have the President of the United States saying we need to fund pensions in Ukraine. Meanwhile, the pensions of our fellow Americans are in greater jeopardy. Mr. Here, our recess lasted a little bit longer than we anticipated due to votes. Um, I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Dr. Singer, in your testimony, you talked about the market demand for fentanyl, for drugs generally, but specifically for fentanyl. Uh, and I, I guess I wanted to assess the utility of that analysis in the context of a drug that is often spliced into other things that people are using. Um, Ma'am, did, did your son seek out fentanyl? Was he part of the market demand for fentanyl? Absolutely not. He bought a pill on Snapchat, a blue Perk 30, and it, it had fentanyl in it. And Mr. Maltz, in, in your extensive experience at DEA, you know, do you find that fentanyl is being laced into uh, what people believe to be Percocet? 100%, yes. And, and Xanax as well? Yes, sir. And marijuana? Uh, there are cases of marijuana. We don't know the extent of that, but there have been fatalities reported with fentanyl in marijuana, and yes. M MDMA? And ecstasy? Do we Not see sure about too much of that, but definitely in heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine. But more importantly, it's the pure fentanyl that's in the pills and the powder. And they're making these pills, millions of them every day. There's, there's pill press locations. Well, I, I get if someone, I get that you would think about something as an overdose. If someone was seeking out fentanyl, they believed they were taking a certain amount of it, they end up taking more, and they end up overdosing. But if someone thinks that they're using a different substance, that doesn't strike me as an overdose. That strikes me as a poisoning. It, 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 does, it, yeah, Dr. Singer, I'd, I'd love your, your thoughts on it, because yeah. probably on the Republican side, I am the easiest to concur that the war on drugs is one that has been won by drugs. Yeah, well, uh, Congressman Gates, uh, you, maybe you misunderstood me. There, is, there are some people who actually want fentanyl, but for the most part, it's prohibition and the black market that it created that is responsible for this, because as I mentioned about the iron law of prohibition, that is what incentivizes the cartels to come up with more potent forms. So initially, around 2012 or so, we were seeing fentanyl appear as a mixture with heroin to increase, to boost its potency so that they could smuggle it in smaller amounts and sell it into more units. Then it really got accelerated when the cartels realized it's easier to synthesize. You don't have to rely on the opium poppy being shipped. And, and the reason why we're seeing so many innocent people who are, for example, buying a, a Percocet, they think, even Prince, Prince, he liked to use Vicodin. 
And his dealer, he thought his dealer got him Vicodin, but the toxicology report showed he died of a fentanyl overdose. It wasn't in, the, in those cases that people were seeking fentanyl. It's that this is what happens when you have a black market. Sure. So, so, uh, so I, wanted, I wanted to ask you a little bit about those relationships between the dealers and um, the users. I found a tweet of yours from back in 2019 where you say, when people cross political borders, they're not violating anyone's rights, given that they are simply exercising their natural God-given rights of freedom of travel, economic liberty, freedom of contract, and freedom of association. When you say freedom of contract, like, are you talking about the contract between the drug traffickers and the users? No, I'm talking about a contract, for example, between a, a farmer and somebody uh, who has, is offering to work on their farm and help pick crops, for example. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the farmer because we were just in Yuma, Arizona, and we met with a lot of the growers. These are like third, fifth generation growers, and what, what they tell us about their freedoms and, and their property rights, property rights that I think Cato cares deeply about, is that they get violated by migrants who uh, defecate in their fields, who create contamination for the food supply, and these are not insurable losses. So they just have to, to eat these losses. And like, do, do, does the violation of the property rights of the farmers you mentioned of course. concern you? That would be trespassing on private property, so. Right, but don't you think that the open borders policies that you've advocated for uh, increase the frequency of that violation of people's property rights? Um, people have no right to come on someone else's property without their permission. Um, I'm not here as an immigration expert, but I can tell you as a libertarian, uh, the overarching, overarching principle is that uh, fun our fundamental inalienable rights are not limited to people in the United States. It's a human Phenomenal. Oh. All humans, and all humans have the right to freedom of movement. But not across somebody else's property, right? I beg your pardon? Not across somebody's private property. Not private think, property, no. Do you think that everybody in the world has freedom of movement across our border? Unfortunately, no. But you would like that to be the case. Well, I think borders are for governments and uh, not for people. I don't know, Dr. Borders so, right, to I, see, where I would observe that governments have to govern the conduct of people. And that the role of our government is to secure our border, and that if it's open, it's the property rights you're concerned about and the life and health of our fellow Americans that continues to degrade. But I, I appreciate the colloquy and appreciate all the witnesses being here. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, for five minutes. Mr. Storch, you're our watchdog. Ukraine has a corruption problem, right? Uh, you, there's a long history of issues with corruption in Ukraine. I don't Infrastructure find... minister arrested for stealing $400,000. Deputy head of Zelensky's office can't explain where the sports cars came from, so he had to resign. A deputy defense minister resigned over contracting corruption, but the defense ministry put out a statement that his resignation was a worthy deed. And the wife of a former Ukrainian politician was found with $22 million in cash crossing the border into Hungary last year. Seems as though a lot of the zeal for enforcement of the anti-corruption efforts seems to align with the Republican control of the House of Representatives in our country. Maybe that's a coincidence, but let's get to this, this end-use monitoring you testified to. The Arms Control Act of 1996 requires end-use monitoring for certain defense art articles that are sold or leased, right? Correct. And there's no feature of anything we've passed that exempts what we've given to Ukraine from those requirements in the Arms Control Act, right? Not, not exempts. There are different uh, provisions as to how that plays but out that in different circumstances. that is controlling law, controlling policy, and here's, here's the upshot. As you testify here today, you cannot testify, truthfully under oath, that the DOD has complied with the policy and law regarding end-use monitoring during all times of this conflict. Isn't that right? So I, I want to be careful here when I respond to you, Congressman, to make sure that, that I'm clear. We are conducting a series of evaluations that look at the controls that DOD has in place to ensure that they are taking the steps that are required. I, I, I get all that, but, but here's the, the operative question. We haven't complied with, with end-use monitoring according to the law with everything we've sent to Ukraine to date, have we? So our 2020 report, which is our last public report on this, made a number of recommendations. All of those have been I know, met. I know, but you're, you're sort of dodging the question. You cannot testify that we have complied with the end-use monitoring requirements at all times during this conflict, can you? So our, our, we have an ongoing evaluation right now. I get right that it's now. ongoing. I'm looking backwards. You cannot testify that everything is complied with the law and the end-use monitoring, can you? 
So uh, some of that gets into the classified report that right, we issued right. previously. But I think everyone watching this could but, see that if you could testify to that, you would. You're citing a classified report. I don't know why that report's classified. I think the American people deserve to know if this 1996 law is being followed or not. You can't testify that it is being followed, and so I think they can draw reasonable conclusions from that. Do we, have, Dr. Call, do we have uh, DOD personnel in Ukraine now? We do. We have a couple dozen at the embassy. Other than the embassy, any other personnel? Nope. How about CIA? Are there tr training folks in Ukraine? Uh, I'm not going to talk about that in, a, in an unclassified setting. Happy to talk about that further in the classified briefing. Is the Azov Battalion getting access to U.S. weapons? Uh, not that I'm aware of, um, but if you have information, uh, I'd, I'd happy to I'd seek consent to enter into the record the Global Times investigative report. That, uh, indicate, that talks about training. It's uh, from the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensics Research Lab, uh, citing that the Azov Battalion was even getting stuff as far back as 2018. Without objection, so ordered. Any reason to disagree with that assessment, Dr. Is this Paul? the, I'm sorry, is this the Global Times from China? No, this is, well. That's what you read. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, would that be a reason? Uh, I, I, as a general matter, I don't take Beijing's propaganda. Well, no, no, yeah, but just value. tell me if the, if the allegation is true or false. I mean, it, uh, I don't have any evidence one way or the okay. other. As a general matter, I don't take Beijing's propaganda at face value. Fair, fair enough. I would agree with that assessment. April 2022, uh, President Biden is describing the supplemental funding that we're providing to Ukraine. He says, quote, it's also going to help schools and hospitals open. It's going to allow pensions and social support to be paid to the Ukrainian people so they have something, something in their pocket. So do, it, it's, help me understand how U.S. taxpayers paying for pensions in Ukraine is, is a good idea for our country. Uh, I would defer you to other parts of our government. The Department of Defense doesn't have a role in, in uh, pensions in Ukraine. You're a senior Biden administration official. The president said that it's really important that we keep funding the pensions in Ukraine. I would observe that the U.S. Census Bureau says that in 2022, the U.S. pension shortfall is $1.4 trillion. So, while we have a corrupt Ukrainian government, while we have our watchdog here who can't say that we followed the law on in use monitoring, we have the President of the United States saying we need to fund pensions in Ukraine. Meanwhile, the pensions of our fellow Americans are in greater jeopardy. Mr. Chairman, I see that my time has expired, but I seek uh, unanimous consent to enter a number of articles into the record. If I'm uh, objection, so ordered. Uh, very well. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Chair Thank you very much. Chair recognizes Mr. Gates for his five minutes. The Nonpartisan Government Accountability Office issues a report in June of 2016. Firearms data. The ATF did not always comply with the Appropriations Act restriction and should better adhere to its policies. Uh, Mr. Wilcox, you're the witness the Democrats have invited here today. Are you familiar with that report? I am. And does the fact that the ATF broke the law concern you? Um, the report, I believe, supported ATF's action in cataloging records to stop crime. I'll read from it. It says, a technical defect allows ATF agents to access data, including purchaser data, beyond what ATF policy permits. Do you take any umbrage with that conclusion? ATF has been collecting out-of-business records pursuant to a law signed by Ronald Reagan, and President Trump digitized more records than any other president. I don't care who did it. I'm just worried about the impact on my citizens. And I would acknowledge there may be Republican presidents who didn't do enough in the 80s to protect our gun rights. But on this finding, the ATF had to delete 252 million records, didn't they? So this is a tool that's helped solve 50% of crime. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Did they have to delete 252 million records? What I know about this tool is that it's Th a That's how I'm asking tool. you. Did they have to delete? You said you're aware of the report. Is that conclusion correct? They had to delete 252 million records. I'm not aware of that line, but what I'm aware okay. of is the tool. Well, I, I'll, I'll, tool. I'll represent to you that that's what had to happen. The fact that the government collected 252 million records that was beyond the law, beyond policy, never approved according not to me, not to my fellow Republicans, but to the GAO, should that be concerning to us, that scope of records being collected? ATF's collection of out-of-business records was fully complying with the law. That's the issue, not what the GAO said, so you disagree with the GAO report. Well, there's two points they made. One is the collection of out-of-business paper records that, that FFLs keep. The second piece was the collection of electronic records that FFLs keep. 
And what the GAO said was they, the electronic records were not being converted sufficiently. And that's right. what ATF so that's why they had to, to become them. in compliance they with illegally, the law. Because they had gone beyond their authority. You see, that's, that's the concern of my constituents. When they go beyond their authority, and you may find those things virtuous, but no one elected you. They elected us to make the laws, and when we make the laws and they don't follow them, then people's rights get diminished. Another area is this issue of the arm braces. Now, in Mr. Wilcox's testimony, he says that an arm brace makes a weapon more powerful. Mr. Bosco, you know a lot about arm braces, don't you? I do. Do arm braces make firearms more powerful? They do not. They do not. Does it concern you that the witness that the Democrats brought would, would make such a claim that is, is obviously disproven by any utilization of those arm braces? I hope that my testimony today can help everyone here understand that the brace does nothing to make the weapon any more dangerous than it already is. And so when you've got the ATF going beyond their authority, collecting 252 million records that they have to destroy, well, that can just be explained because they're doing their best. But when Americans get inadvertently converted to felons because the ATF has exceeded their authority, there is no such grace for them, is there, Ms. Ware? Uh, that would seem to be the case under the, the recent policy change to zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for our fellow Americans when they're trying to exercise their rights and protect their liberties, but all the tolerance in the world for a corrupt bureaucracy that is violating the law, exceeding their authority, and collecting records that they have no business collecting. Um, I would make this final observation. I had the great privilege to spend two years on the House Judiciary Committee with the gentlelady from Missouri, and while she and I disagree strongly on this issue, her beliefs are sincere, and they are strong, and they are powerful, particularly when she expresses them. And so when she says to people that she wants to defund the police, she means it. And when she says in this committee meeting that gun violence is a public health emergency, well, she means that too. And our fellow Americans know the impact of folks up here in Washington declaring everything and anything a public health emergency. It means you're more likely to be locked in your homes, deprived of your freedoms, less healthy, less safe, less secure, and less able to live a truly American life. So know this, when the left talks about this as a public health emergency, get ready to see those enhanced authorities abused by the ATF. And Mr. Chairman, it is my sincere hope that, it's, that in the very near future, we will have those very folks from the ATF here. And I intend to be utilizing the new rules that we have in the House of Representatives to offer amendments to the Appropriations Act to zero out their salaries for breaking the law and abusing the liberties of our fellow Americans. I would like to go back to the tweets of the racist person that works for you. What does caudacity mean? I have no idea, Congressman. You took six months to investigate one tweet? You didn't even figure out what the words meant? I didn't investigate the thing. She's a DOD. Well, uh, you she's said a, in the Fox News a... article that you were going to take 30 days and investigate, and it took you six months. In, in a six-month investigation, you guys didn't learn what caudacity meant? I think you know. I think every person that's going to watch this exchange knows you know. It's, it's, she's trying to lash audaciousness with someone being Caucasian, isn't she? I have no idea, Congressman. Wow, what an investigation. When she well, says PD I did sessions, not, I will says, say I did not do the investigation. She is a, a GS employee that's employed by Dodia. Well, Dodia conducted the investigation. Gosh, uh, the Pentagon told Fox News Digital that Gil Cisneros would provide a final decision in 30 days. So they gave, so someone at the Pentagon is throwing your name out there as being responsible for this, and now it looks foolish that you're suggesting you don't know what that means. PD, well, I would say PD, that, hold on, that quote sessions. did not come from let's me. Go to, let's go to this, Mr. Cisneros. From. What's a PD session? Um, my guess would be personal development. Personal development. You don't think it's professional development? Another open too. matter for the investigation that it didn't resolve. So you don't know what caudacity means. She's obviously talking about professional development there. And like when she says, I had to stop, the, or let's go to the next claim. The caudacity to say that black people can be racist too. Mr. Cisneros, can black people be racist too? I've already stated, Congressman, that I didn't agree with her statements. But uh, I'm asking Department about that Defense provision. Can black people be racist? Uh, this, this 
question is about me or my personal beliefs, but again, well, I, you're I the don't, leading official I, over DEI. I don't a agree. racist person who works for you puts out these tweets, and you won't say whether you agree or disagree. I told with you, Mr. Chairman, I, I just don't want to remind members to observe tweets. standards of decorum. This is okay? decorum. It's my time. Can black people be racist? I do. I do not agree with that tweet. Do you agree with that statement? I'm asking you a statement. Can black people be racist? I'm not going to answer that, Congressman. Why not? Because it's, it's, you're asking me a personal opinion, and that's not what this well, is Well, actually, about. I'm asking you in your capacity as a senior DOD official in the Biden administration who is where we see recruiting falling off the table, whether or not the embrace of racist tweets, whether shuffling these people around rather than firing them, and whether this little exchange here is helping or hurting recruiting. Let's go ahead and put up the recruiting. I, I will tell you, we do not support racist tweets. We do not support racism. Well, did you military. fire this lady? Again, you hired I, her. As I stated, I did not hire her. As she DOD was, hired her. As, as it was stated earlier, she's a DODIA employee. She's a GS employee. The inquiry that was done said these these tweets were done on a personal matter. Oh, a personal matter. It, it How was, do you know it's it a personal a matter personal, if you don't know that the PD could stand for within, professional development? And Mr. Cisneros, within. this is a professional development session where she attacked white colleagues and took the position that black people can't be racist. Now, you can't answer basic questions about it, and here's what I would propose to you. This is what we're looking at in recruiting right now. It's fallen off the table. And when you have employees that you don't fire who do racist things and say racist things, then you really hurt the ability to recruit people who want to be part of, a, of an inclusive and diverse force. I would say the data that we have is not, the recruiting is not falling off because of that. But again, the Department of Defense, Dodia, does not agree with the tweets that she made. It was she at 3 o'clock during the work day. You didn't fire her. If someone puts out racist things, do you fire them or do you just move them around? That was not an official, that was not an official, that's her own personal See, Twitter here's, account. Here's the problem with the double standard, Mr. Cisneros. When Caucasian members of the military post about the Second Amendment or supporting building the wall, you all seem to be on a white supremacy snipe hunt. You seem to take people's personal views and weaponize them against them. And I've had people in my district who serve that wonder whether or not some joke that they forwarded or meme that they liked is going to result in the ruining of their careers. But you have no such interest when it's a person like this. You delayed the investigation. Your own name was what, on, what DOD put out as conducted the investigation. You delayed it. This lady makes like $160,000 a year. Do you really think today the taxpayer should be paying this lady that amount of money? The uh, investigation was not conducted by me. That was never... Well, why did the Pentagon say it was you? I don't know who the uh, Pentagon in that said that, but I will tell you it was a misstatement. But Mr. Chairman, true. I seek the to enter... The investigation was well, conducted what, by DoDia because she's a DoDia employee. Well, it... it if you just fired racist people, then maybe you wouldn't have to go through this. But, Mr. Chairman, I have a series of unanimous consent requests. Without objection. So, so first is Pentagon drags out decision after probe into woke diversity chief accused of anti-white people's tweets. The second is wing selected as DODEA chief of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that uh, is from DODEA.edu. The next is, everybody can be racist. DOD chief diversity educator defends tweets targeted toward white educators. I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, you told Senator Schmidt yesterday that if the 8,000 plus service members who've been separated from the military due to the vaccine mandate want to reapply, that they're welcome to do so, but that you would do nothing to solicit their reapplication or to incentivize it. Why is that? I think it's incumbent upon the individual to, to make that decision and reapply it. The mechanisms are there. Yeah, but why don't, I mean, you're overseeing a recruiting nightmare in our military right now. These are 8,000 patriots. And by the way, your department broke the law in administering the vaccine mandate. And that's not me saying so. That's the inspector general for the Department of Defense who wrote in, on June 2nd of 2022, we found a trend of generalized assessments rather than the individualized assessment that is required by federal law. The department did not break the law. Uh, the vaccine so the DO, so wait, wait, wait. you mean the IG mandate, is wrong? You think the, the IG is wrong? Mandate he says he broke the law. The lives of a number of, uh, of well, it ruined the lives of a number of people too. And it ruined the lives of people who love our country and want to re-enlist. Let me ask you this question. If we direct you by force of law to re-engage and incentivize the re-enlistment of these folks with full back pay and rank, do you have the capability to follow that instruction? You put uh, provisions in the law 
uh, to enable those, uh, those people to, to uh, those former service members to reapply in accordance with the service man, service. Good. Uh, well, we will do that just like we had to put the repeal of the VAX mandate in the law. And I get the sense that the only reason you're not reaching out to these folks is pride because otherwise they would be totally able to serve and it seems that your personal pride is getting in the way. So going from the deeply serious things that we're not doing, re-engaging these 8,000 folks, to the deeply unserious things that we are doing, go ahead and put up the first slide. I, I guess my question is, how much taxpayer money should go to fund drag queen story hours on military bases? You know, drag, drag queen story hours is not something that uh, the department funds. Wait a second. That's actually not what the record seems to suggest. You were going to fund one at Ramstein Air Force Base. That one got canceled, but that's DOD insignia. That's a drag queen story hour for children. Then also at uh, Malstrom Air Force Base outside of Great Falls, Montana, you had a, a drag queen story hour for kids. At the Joint Base Langley Eustis, you put on a drag queen story hour on a Saturday for the first ever kid-friendly diversity, equity, inclusion summer festival. And at Nellis Air Force Base, you had the Drag U Nellis on June 17th. Who funded these things, Mr. Secretary? Listen, uh, drag shows and, uh, are not something that the Department of Defense uh, supports or funds. So. But wait, why, why are they happening on military bases? I just, I just showed you the evidence. Why are they happening? I will say again. This is not something that we support or fund. Well, you, so you think hosting a drag queen story hour on a military base isn't supporting the drag queen story hour? I stand by what I just said. But, but you may stand by it, but it's belied by the evidence over and over again. I mean, are, 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 are you aware of the uh, piece, uh, Biden's military, Air Force Base in Montana holds drag show, drag queen story hour for kids in the Western Journal. Are you aware of that? Again, I but, will say what I said yeah, before. You're saying what you're saying, but I guess it just doesn't comport with the facts. General Milley, this will be my last time to question you. You mentioned two years ago that you wanted to better understand white rage. And so my question is this. Did you read this book? No, not at all. What is, well, it, what, it, it is, uh, What is White Privilege is the book, and it's actually written by a DOD official, a senior official in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and there are now hundreds of these books in dozens of schools, and I wonder if you guys connect this to your problems with recruiting. I've never read it, never seen it. Um, I, frankly, I don't even think about that stuff. I think about well, put readiness. Up the next, put, go ahead and put up the next about slide. The readiness of the force. Go ahead and put up the next slide, please. Okay, well, in, in the next slide, this is a tweet by one of your employees in charge of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's, it's patently racist. They say that uh, she had to give Karen the business, that she talks about caudacity, presumably of Caucasian people. So I guess, terrible. why does the... I, I, look at it. Well, why is that person like You're not going to get an argument from me. That's terrible. It's wrong. She shouldn't be doing that, period. Should she be fired? I don't... That's a DOD employee, not U.S. military uniform. Do okay. I, Should they be I would, fired, would Secretary I Austin? Uh, again, as you heard in your uh, subcommittee here, uh, this, this incident was investigated and uh and, and they're still employed mr chairman i have a series of unanimous consent requests since my time has expired without objection uh, uh, first is joint base langley eustis holds drag show at kid friendly festival and the next is u.s military defends drag show at largest training center as quote essential to morale and the next is nellis air force base hosts first ever drag queen show essential to morale and readiness that's a Breitbart piece. And uh, finally, Ramstein cancels library's drag queen story time for Pride Month following criticism. Without objection, so what? Our gentleman's time's expired. Can I just, can I get copies of those? Because I'd like to take a look at those myself, actually. Take a look and, and find out what actually is going on there. Because I, that's the first I'm hearing about that kind of stuff. Um, I don't read those news stories. I don't know what you're talking about. I'd like to take a look at those because I don't agree with those. Well, they're think, now in I think the official those record. Shouldn't be happening. Period. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for that admission. Great. I would like to point out, uh, Chairman, that uh, our, our students in Dodia schools scored the highest on, uh, the eighth graders and fourth graders scored the highest in math and reading in the country. So I want to thank uh, all, of the, all of our Dodia uh, professionals who made that possible, and I encourage them to keep it up. Well, I hope you're not thanking that one. Yeah. 
Gentleman's time has expired. The woman's time has expired. Yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. White House staffers are some of the most powerful people on the planet Earth. Oftentimes, they get the dispositive opinion on appointments to different positions within the federal government. They influence statements of administrative policy. They uh, initiate regulatory reform. They often have a significant voice on legislation that is considered and approved. And so, Mr. Sauer, I want to understand how many of these intensely powerful people who work in the Biden White House were involved in this effort that you've been investigating regarding the desire to shape discussions on social media? At least 20 and very likely more. And was there a ringleader of this group, someone who had pervasive and uh, repeated efforts to try to coerce social media companies to shape the truth according to the Biden White House? Deputy Assistant to the President Rob Flaherty and also Andy Slavitt. Who is Rob Flaherty? He is the, uh, I believe, the digital coordinator for the White House. His, his level is Deputy Assistant to the President. And what behaviors of Mr. Flaherty did you observe that you found troubling? We've seen many, many pages of emails between Mr. Flaherty and social media platforms where he relentlessly badgers them to increase the censorship of ordinary Americans' free speech on social media, and he gets results. You see the platforms agreeing to censor things that are truthful, that do not violate their policies at the behest and at the pressure of the White House. Can you give an example of that? One great example of this is the Tucker Carlson video that was going viral in April of 2021, where Mr. Flaherty and other White House officials were emailing Facebook privately, demanding that it be censored. Facebook responded, this does not violate our policies. It has not been fact-checked, but nevertheless, we are substantially de-boosting it and limiting its distribution on our platforms, even though we haven't identified anything false in it. And even though it does not, they had a positive determination that it does not violate their policies. And did you assess that Facebook took that action as a direct consequence of the badgering coming from Mr. Flaherty in the Biden White House? That is a compelling inference from the email traffic back and forth that we obtained in discovery. And, and did Mr. Flaherty ever request any reports from social media companies on specific censorship issues? Very frequently. In fact, he was demanding that again and again. His, his steady drumbeat was what he called borderline content, that the email traffic makes clear. Borderline is what they call often true content, things like personal anecdotes, uh, uh, opposition to vaccination expressed in terms of political opposition, things of that nature. That is what he wanted to target, and he was frequently asking for reports back. They were sending in bi-weekly crowd tangle reports to the White House. They did that through the close of our discovery period, last August in 2022. So uh, uh, there was, there was a, a, an overwhelming effort to get them to, to check their homework, if you will, to get them to report back on how much censorship are you doing and is it going to meet our standards as the White House? An overwhelming effort, badgering social media companies, demanding reports from those social media companies directly to someone in the White House. And as my colleagues on, on the other side of the aisle remind us, not all speech is protected. Some speech is illegal. Did you see Mr. Flaherty constrain his concern to unlawful speech or did you often see this badgering and this demand for reports from entirely lawful speech? Virtually everything. I can't remember a single instance of them going after unlawful speech. Almost Virtu all of it was after lawful speech? Virtually everything that I can recall here was a lawful First Amendment protected speech that was being targeted. Uh, we heard from the witness that the Democrats brought today that these were but suggestions that of course the government should be able to make suggestions to social media companies. What would be your response to that testimony? The characterization of them as suggestions is contradicted by overwhelming evidence. Calling Flaherty, for example, Mr. Flaherty's communication suggestions is akin to saying that the earth is flat or the moon is made of green cheese. Well, 
And of course, if someone shared those viewpoints, that would be lawful speech, wouldn't it? You'd be allowed to say that on social media and based on the- Not US if Mr. Flaherty were in charge. <laughs> that is that is the difference. And in fact, what happened was you had a de facto suppression of many, many views, including truthful views, political organization, at the behest of White House officials and other federal officials. And, and I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, that when you have these intensely powerful people with the ability to control so many things even a suggestion is coercive and problematic and worthy of the committee's review. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his uh, five minutes. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to begin by seeking unanimous consent to enter into the record a press release from last year from the Department of Defense entitled, the Department of Defense announces recruiting and retention numbers for fiscal year 2022 through March of 2022, and it reads, overall, it is clear the broader recruiting market continues to deteriorate and recruiting shortfalls can no longer be solely attributed to COVID-19. Without objection. So we just heard from Secretary Austin moments ago that COVID was the driving headwind. That was the headwind was the term he used in these recruiting challenges that trouble us all. But the department is saying that it's not COVID. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out what do you guys think is the driving factor of the recruiting collapse that we are currently overseeing? Any, any of you who are particularly interested? Representative Gates, that's a great question. And what we are seeing is that it's not just one factor. It is a variety of factors when we look at obesity, physical fitness, misconduct, behavioral health challenges, a knowledge gap of what we saw from our data was that uh, individuals that we surveyed identified that they would be potentially putting their life on hold if they serve. So not attributable to one single factor, but a multitude. I, I agree with that. We've got a younger generation that's too dumb, fat, slow, addicted, and on video games to be eligible to serve in the military. And it's really troubling to hear that the response is to thin the soup rather than to do what we can earlier on, maybe through our education system or our nutrition programs, whole of government to try to get a greater share of our folks capable. Do you, does anyone here attribute any of the recruiting challenges we face to the new DEI push? Any, any of you? Raise your hand if you do. None of you. Well, I, I would suggest that that is misguided. I have heard directly from people that this, uh, this, embrace of DEI and white fragility and white rage harms our recruiting effort in the area of the country where we do our best recruiting in the American South. Uh, I have a qu additional questions for you, General Miller. How many Republicans running for Congress had their personnel records unlawfully compromised by the United States Air Force? Uh, thank you for that question. So we did have a PII breach, um, 11 individuals overall. Uh, their data was um, released. Um, well, you say breach. When I hear breach, what I hear is that like someone hacked or broke in or got the information. You gave this information. Yes, we did. No, right. the Air so Force it wasn't a breach. It was an illegal release. It was a yes. It was right. You're right. We take full responsibility for that. Eleven. Eleven. Yes. And all Republicans, right? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I know some of them were, but I think that. But if I represent to you that 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 it's all or almost all Republicans. Almost all Republicans. That's correct. Yes. And it, this information was given to the due diligence entity, right? There was a, there were there was an entity. Yes, it was. Yeah, and it's an opposition entity. research entity that gets hundreds of thousands of dollars from the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and the Democratic Senatorial uh, Campaign Apparatus, right? Um, I don't know that much about due diligence, but there's. I know that we um, release the information Why? inappropriately. Why did you do that? Um, it was a, you know, it was an error. We did an investigation as soon as we found out. We notified all of the members um, in which their data was um, released. Uh, we have put in place uh, multiple layers of uh, checks and balances. We did a retraining. Who's been fired for doing this? Um, we have taken the appropriate action. Okay. Who's been fired? We, we've taken the appropriate action. I, it's a fascinating answer, just not to my question. Who's been fired? I, I can't answer that. Has, has a single person been fired? 
I do not know the answer to that. Shouldn't you, though? I mean, here we are having recruiting challenges. You guys are releasing personnel information of predominantly Republicans to a Democrat opposition research firm. You run personnel for the United States Air Force, and you can't tell me whether anyone has been fired for this unauthorized release? Congressman, I can tell you that we have taken the appropriate action. Well, but, but, but you OSI. deem it appropriate. But what if we don't? Because because we have civilian control of the military. Mm -hmm. and we may have to change our laws to hold people accountable. And pardon me for not trusting your vague reference to the layers that you've put on. But, Mr. Chairman, I, I request that this committee get specific answers for what the accountability regime was for this unlawful action by the United States Air Force and that we not take as an article of faith the representation that they think they've taken the appropriate action. They've taken the illegal, inappropriate action to compromise these records, and I think we should hold them accountable for it. Um, on that note, General Miller, for, for the record, can you submit to the committee what those appropriate yes, actions were? Yes, we certainly may. Okay, I yield five minutes to Representative Houlihan. Thank you uh, very much for your testimony today. I am going to try it. And Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, for five minutes. General Langley, I have constituents that have been scattered across Africa on train and equip missions. So just ballpark in the last decade, how many Africans has the United States military trained and equipped? Uh, Congressman, I don't have that uh, figure. I can get that figure for you. Ballpark, though. just, you know, how many? Uh, Congressman, it would be a wild, it would be a wild guess, right? Seems now. like something we should know, right? Over the years, um, we have trained a substantial number, especially in uh, the Gulf of Guinea uh, states, um, uh, but and including like more than ten thousand. It is more than ten thousand. More than fifty thousand. I'd say we're, we're reaching around fifty thousand okay. at least. And, and and what percentage of the people we've trained? end up participating in insurrections or coups against their own government? Very small number, Congressman, very small number. So what percentage do you think? I'd say probably less than 1%. But it does uh, happen. The, right? the IMET program is in, in force, in, uh, uh, and we've pushed a number, uh, a significant number through our schools uh, across the yeah, And, and what data control. sets do you track to arrive at the conclusion that less than 1% of the roughly 50,000 that we've trained have participated in coups? Because um, it would be like about 500, about 1% of 50,000. Uh, Congressman, you may have that information. I, I don't at this time, but I know. Well, I know there are long. some, right? Like in, go ahead and throw up that image. This is uh, Colonel Mamade Dumbuya, and this is a photo of, of him. Did we train and equip him? In Guinea? Uh, by name, I, I cannot identify that. Well, well, that guy in the middle with the big red hat, Colonel Mamade Dumbuya, that, that's him with a bunch of U.S. service members outside of our embassy. And just months after this photo was taken in 2021, he led a coup in Guinea and, and threw out the, the leader. Does that concern you? Congressman, core values is what we start off with in IMA pr programs. Do we, we share stick core values with Colonel Dumbuya? Core values. I will repeat that. Core values, know, respect for humanity. Do we do we share those values with Colonel? DeBuke? Absolutely, in our in we our do? curriculum. He led a coup. We do. Okay, well, I, I, that's a very telling answer. In Burkina Faso, did we share core values with the uh, leader that we trained there, who led a coup? It's in our curriculum. We Leading stress core values. Curriculum. We request civilian-led governance. Wait, 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 uh, so wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is leading coups in our curriculum? Absolutely not. So civilian so led, civilian is, led. My question is, do we share core values with the coup leader in Burkina Faso who we trained? Holistically, we teach whole, uh, uh, you know, core values uh, with a respect for civilian governance, apolitical, and that's what sticks across a, a high, very high percentage in the 90, 90 over not 90 everybody, percentile. Right? But not everybody. And, and when it, I wonder how many people it takes to, to plan a coup. I mean, initially you didn't know how many we trained and equipped. Then you said it was 1%. You had no base, basis for that 1% number because there's no data set you track. Mr. Chairman, I seek to, uh, unanimous consent to enter into the record. Another U.S. trained soldier stages a coup in West Africa by the intercept. Without objection, so ordered. And I, I further seek unanimous consent to enter into the record. U.S. forces trained the Guinean colonel behind the recent coup in West African country, and this is regard to Guinea. Without objection, so ordered. So I guess the, the question is, why should U.S. taxpayers be paying 
to train people who then lead coups in Africa. Congressman, our curriculum harvests this core values and also uh, to, uh, to be able to embolden these countries for a representative democracy. But, but, but General, that democracy isn't what emerges. The problem is, I, I know you, you may have great confidence in what you're teaching, but when two governments have been overthrown, I guess, at how many governments have to be overthrown by people we train before you sort of get the message that our core values might not be sticking with everyone? Is it five countries? Ten? We'll, we'll continue with our persistence in assuring but do you think it's that working? they harbor they, that they harbor democratic norms, you, democratic values. Just a moment ago, you said, you said we shared core values with Colonel Dembuya. You said, you said that just moments ago in response to my question, and his core value seems to be leading a coup. So I, I don't think it's stuck. I think we should at least know how many countries we train the coup plotters in. Uh, how many is too many? Because clearly two is not too many, and I think we could use our resources far more effectively than doing this. Gentlemen, time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Ryan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, in particular, I just want to thank. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. <clears throat> How many guns has the ATF lost? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, uh, is it a difficult question to understand? Uh, well, <laughs> I, are, I don't know if you're referring to. Uh, any particular incident or time How many period. instances should we be looking at where you've lost guns? Um, so if, if what you're referring to is what happened at the National Destruction Branch, no guns were lost. They were stolen by an individual who's now in prison right. uh, who was right. not and an but, ATF employee. But there were recommendations made on what you should do so that you don't become the victim of the theft and the Inspector General saying you're not following them. I'm quoting directly from the Inspector General's report. Thousands of firearms, firearms, parts, and ammunition had been stolen from the ATF. So you gave testimony that the brave ATF agents are the ones showing up at 2 in the morning after a burglary, but it seems as though in this case you were the one burglarized. Why have you not followed the recommendations of the, of the Office of Inspector General so that you aren't the mark? Um. Again, uh, it is, it, I, I want to say that it is a brave women of, of a, men and women of ATF who do do this. That's not a, a well, I know what they're doing. I know what they're doing. They're day. getting robbed on one hand, so you can't keep a hold of the guns you're supposed to have, but then you do keep a hold of a bunch of stuff you're not supposed to have a hold of. We, the GAO report, firearms data, ATF did not always comply with the Appropriations Act restriction and should better adhere to its policies. As a result of breaking the law, didn't you guys have to go and delete like a quarter of a million records that you illegally kept? Uh, again, uh, with respect to both the Inspector General reports that you're talking nope, about. Nope, one's Inspector we, General, one's GAO. Well, Very the, GA, the, the, yep. the, the, the Inspector General report uh, ATF that happened uh, several years ago, more than that. 2022. And ATF, and ATF the has the, the report came out, but the theft and yeah. ATF has implemented uh, numerous different safety measures with respect to the national uh, destructive brand. Well, I mean, he, I'm, I'm to reading safeguard. to you from the report from last year, Mr. Director. We found that the NDB staff does not currently, currently in 2022, adhere to established operating procedures in place to mitigate risk of firearms being lost and stolen. So I guess I, th that shows an ATF that is not functioning correctly and is not responding to the problems you create. You keep records you're not supposed to. It was a quarter million of them you had to delete, right? Um, I, I don't believe that that is uh, Was it over 200,000 that you had to delete? Uh, so what, what, what was happening was... I just want to know the number of records you had to delete that were not being lawfully, lawfully maintained. There were there were records that were had not actually been searched, but my understanding Hundreds of thousands is were searchable. Of them. And so that's what you guys do. You keep what you shouldn't keep. You lose what you're not supposed to lose. But how do you treat regular Americans? I got this letter from someone in my district, uh, a firearms dealer. I have been a firearms dealer for 46 years. For 46 years, I've had a good relationship with law enforcement. Then came the ATF's zero tolerance policy. Two years ago, while in the process of selling a firearm to a customer, I completed their background check using Florida's FDLE firearm purchasing program. The background check was uneventful, and FDLE rendered an approval number. 
Some months later, during an ATF audit, I was told the background check was now a non-approval. Even though FDLE made the error, it was on my paperwork, so ATF deemed it a willful error. After completing close to 50,000 background checks over 46 years, why would I willfully ignore this background check? The answer is simple, I did not. But the ATF has revoked my license, ended my career, and my livelihood. So I guess the question is, why should you be able to destroy the life of one of my constituents over a technicality where they weren't even at fault when you all lose thousands of guns and illegally keep hundreds of thousands of records? Respectfully, uh, with res Congress has, has given us uh, the authority to inspect and make sure that firearms dealers, the vast majority by the which are compliant, they are our first line of defense. Um, in, in dealing with uh, straw purchases. This guy isn't your first line of defense anymore. He's fired. But a very small uh, minority, those dealers, uh, after due process, uh, have a been small minority, A small minority, ATF, enforcer of gun laws, lost thousands of firearm parts to thieves. New data shows ATF gun store restrictions at the highest rate in 16 years. Mr. Director, the definition of hypocrisy is when you can't live up to your own standard. So you have imposed a zero tolerance policy that is resulting in the highest rate of revocations in 16 years, and you wouldn't be able to meet your own zero tolerance policy because you lose stuff you're supposed to keep, and then you keep stuff that it's illegal to keep. Uh, and by the way, I am one of those MAGA Republicans that would defund your salary, your agency, and I, don't, I, and I think all these good things that you say exist could happen with those folks at the local and state level, and this is a, is a terrible abuse of power. Um, so many New Yorkers will soon become Florida voters. <laughs> this is an iconic city. It's actually our nation's most iconic mm -hmm. city. And it's not because of the beautiful architecture, and it's not because of the geography. It is because the sense of hustle that is so inherent to the people who come to New York to achieve their dreams. And increasingly, that hustle is being replaced with fear. Uh, uh, Mr. Holt, Councilman Holden, you and I are from different parties. If we talked about a thousand things, we'd probably disagree about a vast majority of them. But here is my simple question for you. Is fear a rising feature of life in New York, or is fear a declining feature of life in New York? It, it is um, increasingly worrisome what we're going through in New York City. Fear is an everyday event in New York City. Taking the subway, my wife is Asian American. She will not get on a New York City subway. My daughter will not get on a New York City subway for fear because many Asian Americans have been attacked. But Mr. Kessler says there's just a lot of people here in Manhattan. You just have to take it. You right. just have to understand that this is going to be a violent place. Which I found, I found that insulting. Uh, well, Mr. DiGiacomo, you're here as the voice of, of law enforcement in, in many ways. And since the days of Cain and Abel, there has constantly been a violent criminal element as some feature of American society. And the lives we all get to live are lashed to whether or not we put that violent criminal element in charge or whether or not we constrain it for the sake of people who want freedom. And so my question for you is, when the day one memo of Alvin Bragg changes the way resisting arrest is treated so people can resist arrest against law enforcement and not uh, actually face a consequence for that, what does that do to the enterprise of policing? Well, it makes the, uh, the officers and the detectives on the street their job that much harder. Uh, everything becomes confrontational or physical, and they put themselves, the police officers and detectives, are in harm's way. Well, now, we, we I, don't want to do that, but I have only, only a moment. Let's see again, Inspector General, we appreciate you and all the great memories of the team, and I want you to know we do read your reports. Uh, yesterday, I was working with the ATF director about why they weren't following some of the recommendations you put forward, and I know that that was appreciated. I also take note of our distinguished ranking members call for this FISA reform to be bipartisan and to be nonpartisan, which at times are two different things. And I think it is thoughtful and mature 
uh, and I would do all I can to resist the temptation to secretly point out that the very political recognition that was willing to testify about is also directly against the government. Big point, big point, that you never follow, and I think thoughtful advice will we'll try to avoid the seeking on that point of legal aid and not otherwise. I, I want to get into the three point four million doctor insurgents that the ranking member pointed out in his opening statement. Uh, Mr. Slater General, how should the public think about this? Well, I think what we've seen in the various public reports. Um, and I'm limited in what I can say about the public, because I think it's one of the issues that we're really talking about is transparency here. Um, it's, it's obviously very concerning that there is a bad volume of searches, um, and particularly concerning the error rate that was reported on in the last two years um, in the public report. Now, the error rate is what? Um, I believe it was around 30%. Um, I, I think I can't remember. I think it's around 30%. I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician, but 3.4 million, about 30%. You're talking about seven figures of error in terms of these searches. I wonder how many people can perform these doctoral reports? I'm going to defer to board members because you have a view on that. I'm afraid I don't have those figures at my fingertips in terms of the number of people that can conduct those types of searches. But I uh, share the concern of expressing the question that we need to uh, have great support, and I urge Congress to incorporate a requirement for five court review of these kinds of searches to protect the records. Four million searches, more than a million of them in error. Uh, if I represent to you that we believe there may be more than 10,000 people in the federal government that could perform those queries. Exactly right. It's one of the concerns we saw in the Title I work we did on the Carter Page Project, which is uh, to some extent that this is uh, relying, well, it is relying entirely on what the government tells it. So, in some respects, it's unfair to look to the fix to try and do uh, the kind of work that, as you noted, the defense lawyer would do. I was a federal prosecutor, I was a defense lawyer as well. Um, there's a chance that they will ignore the whole of the federal prosecutors in contempt. I'll just say on the Carter Page Project, one of the problems that we found, one of the serious problems we found, was the FBI was sitting on information and wasn't telling the prosecutor. If I was in a civil litigation environment in North Florida and I was withholding evidence that the other side had a right to, I would expect the judge to check me. I know you don't know the secret court, but perhaps the message that the state would ignore them. Yeah, it's even less of a secret court than the adversarial process. We have this 3.4 million doctoral case, more than a million of them in error. And it just doesn't seem like the OJ is listening to the other people on the left page of page 50. In 2019, you write a 478 page report detailing the problems. In 2020, you publish a management advisory that lays out the problems. In 2021, you lay out additional reforms that excuse yourself every time. You write a report. And then the DOJ comes in and tells us that they think they now have fixed everything and it's super light. And then you write another report showing that there hasn't been sufficient compliance. I know there's a report coming after this hearing, but I think that just continues the cycle until we can come into the the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, it's always an honor to have you in our district. The folks at Air Force Special Operations Command at Hurlburt Field were, were particularly honored and grateful to be able to share the work they do with you. I've got a niche issue there that uh, I hope I can draw your attention to. The 919th is the reserve component at Duke Field that supports a lot of what Air Force Special Operations Command does. Got a lot of uh, 
the pilots there, got a lot of special tactics folks there with a lot of experience, live in the community, have come out of uh, oftentimes AFSOC. And right now there seems to be some confusion about what the future of the 919th is and the 711th therein uh, because uh, AFRIC sees that they've got a price tag and AFSOC sees that they've got a price tag and because they nestle between those two, uh, there's gonna be hundreds of billets come October that are fully funded, but with no real mission, because the Dornier that was there is not gonna be there. So uh, I don't expect you to have all the answers to that in this hearing, but at least wanted to use our time to highlight the concerns those folks have. And to every extent, we can encourage General Healy to get an answer to those folks regarding what their future is. Uh, I think it'll help because a whole lot of experience, at times decades of experience, and we don't wanna lose that out of AFSOC or out of the reserve. I'll give you a chance to make any comments if you'd like. We'll take a look at that and get back to you. I don't have details on that for you right now. If you could, if I could take a moment of your time, um, my visit, uh, first district visit I made to your district, I think was one of the most memorable moments of my uh, tenure in office and probably of my life, which was the Doolittle Raider last toast, and uh, that that was a, quite a moment. And I going to Hurlburt was was enjoyable and interesting, but nothing like the uh, significance of that last toast. Yes, uh, and we were there too, also grateful to have General Brown there for that for that as well. Uh, General Brown, I, I do have to ask you a question that sort of stems from what Ms. McLean was asking about. She showed you this curriculum from the Air Force Academy, and she asked you why the terms mom and dad were disfavored. And, and you said that you're working to build cohesive teams. So just wondering, how do the terms mom and dad impair cohesive team building? You know, part of the... Uh leadership is understanding the people you're privileged to lead. And as you have that opportunity, you get to know them. And every one of us grows up differently and has different experiences, different backgrounds. And we can't assume when we engage with them. And so from that perspective, you've got to uh, be, uh, uh, to build that team and to build that trust with, uh, uh, with our airmen. And to, in part, because that trust is part of the cohesion that gives you the, the strong team to be able to go execute what the nation asks us to do. I understand better than most that families at times aren't defined by blood or even paperwork. And I know you have to recruit folks from different family environments into the Air Force. But do you think maybe it puts downward pressure on recruiting some of the people who do have moms and dads and do use the term mom and dad if in the curriculum of the academy it seems to disfavor those terms? No, I don't. And what's your basis for that belief? Because I think part of lead leadership is dignity and respect of those you're privileged to lead. You don't and think it disrespects people? I do not. Tell, you don't I think do it disrespects moms and dads when they send their um, young uh, children, I guess becoming adults, into the academy, and, and then they see that mom and dad are disfavored terms. Do, do you agree that mom and dad should be disfavored terms? I, I think we need to respect the fact that they have either parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles that, that, that sometimes raised uh, young people. Sure, but do you, I, I mean, I know folks who've been raised by aunts and uncles and none of them have ever told me that when they hear someone else call their parent mom or dad that that upsets them. Do, do you know of people who, who, are, who feel excluded when others refer to their parents as mom or dad? I don't, uh, or either way, whether it's aunts, uncles, moms, and dads, I have not uh, come across anyone. That, uh, if I could, sure. the point of that slide, I'm familiar with it, came out of the Air Force Academy. It was actually created by cadets for training, and it's not very artful, but the point was that you shouldn't, uh, it was not to diminish moms and dads. It was to just make people aware that that's, that particular family configuration is not the I don't know, Mr. That Secretary. Was, it, says, it says, uh, that you want to use parents, caregivers, or guardians instead of mom and dad. So when you say instead of, it kind of does seem to disfavor. I, and I appreciate not every slide is perfect. And if you're saying this is an artful and we're not going to try to disfavor mom or dad or make people feel bad, I think that would be progress to hear that, you. That, that, you're, you're correct. It wasn't okay, artful. Great. I don't think they're using that slide anymore. And one thing the chairman and I certainly would not take exception with is that they, you seem to favor the term y'all. So no, no objection there. Gates.
I thank the gentlelady uh, not only for yielding but for her extensive work on these issues, not only during our hearings but during the many depositions we've taken to develop evidence and to bring it forward for the majority, the minority, and all of the country. And Did you I give us those, that she, evidence? I know that if uh, the gentlelady from Are you going to give us that evidence? was uh, able to speak that uh, she'd, she'd certainly She'd certainly be eager to do so. Mr. Allen, we just heard, uh, astonishingly heard a Democrat on this committee question your allegiance to the United States. How many tours in Iraq did you do? I did two tours in Iraq, sir. And, and for how many decades have you held a security clearance? Uh, for two decades, sir. Ever been called into question before? No, sir. And, and you also received the Employee of the Year Award for the Charlotte Field Office, is that right? That is correct, sir. Did you receive any medals during your service for the Marine Corps and the United States Navy? I did, sir. As a member of the Marine Corps, I received two, uh, a Navy Commendation Medal and a Navy Achievement Medal. Seems to me your allegiance to the United States is pretty well established over multiple decades, wearing the uniform, fighting for our country, and I am proud that you continue to fight for our country as a whistleblower here, making a disclosure to the United States Congress. Uh, and Mr. Allen, is it your belief that you were retaliated against because you shared an email that questioned the truthfulness of FBI Director Christopher Wray. Yes, sir. And you believed that he wasn't truthful based on testimony he'd given to the United States Senate, isn't that right? Yes, sir. And in that testimony to the Senate, you believed that Christopher Wray indicated that there were no confidential informants and no uh, FBI assets that were present at the Capitol on January 6th that were part of the violent riot, isn't that right? Yes, sir. Please play the video. We're, we're now going to hear from George Hill, who worked at the Boston field office. The SSA in Boston said they were going to a political rally, which is First Amendment protected activity. No, we're not uploading. We're not starting cases on these people. To which they said, well, we're gonna call your SAC and the SSA said, go right ahead, because when you're pushing back, you know, you want to make sure that you have your, your six covered. So the SAC and the ASAC were intimately aware of these kinds of exchanges that were going on. And again, to his credit, um, Joe Bonavolanta said, no, we're not opening up cases on people who went to a rally. And I forgot a key part. The SSA for CT2 said, happy to do it, show us where they were inside the Capitol, and we'll look into it. To which WFO said, we can't show you those videos unless you can tell us the exact time and place those individuals were inside the Capitol. To which the SSA responded back, and I was privy to these conversations firsthand, <clears throat> why can't you show us, why can't you just send us, the, give us access to the 11,000 hours of video of this exam that's available? Because there may be, may be UCs, undercover officers, or CHS's confidential human, or confidential human sources on those videos whose identity we need to protect. So Mr. Allen, you got retaliated against for the very thing, for saying the very thing that the Washington field office was telling Boston when the Boston field office was saying, we're not going to go and investigate people that just showed up at a rally without sufficient criminal predicate. Uh, the, the Washington field office told Boston, well, you know what, we can't give you the evidence because it might disclose the very CIs and UCs that you are concerned about. But that doesn't surprise you, Mr. O'Boyle, does it? No, sir. And the reason it doesn't surprise you is that in a different part of the country, you saw that same pressure from the Washington field office. And did they ever try to get you to do something that was outside the normal order of law enforcement activity? Yes, sir. And what did the Washington field office try to get you to do that violated the law and regulations? They tried to get me to serve a federal grand jury subpoena when there was no proper predicate to do so. And the reason there was no predicate was because it was based on an anonymous tip, right? That's correct. And Time and again, the Washington field office was trying to pressure you without corroboration to go start process on people. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. 
And so while I agree that January 6th was a violent day, a bad day, a day that nobody wants to relive, violence on January 6th doesn't justify weaponizing the government against people who were innocent and did nothing wrong. Thank you for blowing the whistle on that. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I have a, a legit, sincere point of inquiry. Rule 11, Clause 2. The court is recognized. So which Americans were being targeted? Now, August, 20, August 2nd, 2022, a media organization attained a copy of a document which whistleblowers subsequently authenticated to the committee that is styled the FBI's Domestic Terrorism Symbols Guide on Militia Violent Extremists. Mr. Boyle, are you generally familiar with that guide? Yes. And, and that guide identified certain things that made people more likely to be deemed a threat or terrorists, didn't it? Yes. And wasn't one of those things just the number two and the letter A next to each other? Yes, it was. And in your experience as a law enforcement official, does putting the word two and or the letter two and A next to each other make someone more likely to be violent or lawbreaking? No. And uh, if someone signified the right that they support the right to bear arms, was that also something in the symbol guide? Yes. And how about this one really got me? The Betsy Ross flag. Was the Betsy Ross flag in the terrorism symbol guide? It was. And, and what about the Betsy Ross flag makes someone more <laughs> likely to be a violent extremist? I wish there was a reasonable explanation for that question. There isn't. And people blew the whistle and said, this stuff is crazy. Americans are being targeted. Mr. Friend, you ever been to a school board meeting? Yes, I have. FBI ever sent you to the parking lot of a school board meeting? Yes, they have. And in the parking lot of a school board meeting where the FBI sent you, you were taking down information regarding people's license plates. That's correct. Now, it wasn't the first time you'd been to a school board meeting, was it? No, I went on my own as a private citizen. As a parent? Yes. And so there you were. It must have been quite an interesting perspective. There you were taking down the information of people, parents attending school board meetings on behest of the FBI. And you had been one of those parents at a school board meeting. How did that feel? Well, after I attended privately, my colleagues teased me that they were probably going to start investigating me. You used to go after the worst of the worst, didn't you? Yes, I believe so. You went after people who looked at child porn? Yes. People who were sexually exploiting children? Yes. And then you were in the parking lot of a school board meeting, taking down the information of parents. What happened to the cases that you were working to to protect our communities from the worst predators that exist. I was told they were not to be resourced. Uh, and then uh, after I was suspended, uh, they were handed off to local law enforcement. Wow, so the FBI just decided it was more important to have you in that parking lot of that school board meeting than getting the worst of the worst away from people that they could harm. That's correct. But you deserve the consequences you are getting, according to the ranking member. Mr. O'Boyle, what, the ranking member said that when people break the law, they deserve the consequences they get. And it doesn't matter that they served in the military. So what law did you break before the FBI packed up all your stuff and moved it across the country to Virginia? No true law. The only thing I broke was not towing the line for the FBI. Like I said when I opened, my oath is to the Constitution, not to the FBI. And our laws provide you avenues to talk to Congress, to talk to your supervisors about those concerns, right? Correct. And so you didn't deviate from that, did you? No. no you, didn't, you didn't go to the media first, did you? No. no. You used what the law provided, and your family has paid an exquisite price for that, haven't they? They have. How old were your children when they moved you across the country? <clears throat> Six, five, three, and two weeks. A two-week-old baby, could you get your stuff? Six weeks later. Oh, so for six weeks, almost every possession to your name, the FBI had and wouldn't give back to you. How, how did you, what, what time of year was it? Was it winter, summer? When I reported, it was in September. Uh, so when we were traveling, it was summertime, essentially. So we had basically summer clothes, but then we were uh, basically stranded uh, in Wisconsin, which is where we're from. It gets cold there pretty, pretty quick. And well, I'll take your word for it. I'm a Florida man. But what, what was it like when you had to go and explain to your wife that you didn't have coats for your children because the FBI wouldn't give them back to you? 
it was horrible. I mean, we were uh, asking family for uh, clothes and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it was a difficult time. Yeah, you, were, you became a charity case, didn't you? I did, and now I get derided for that. I never thought I'd have to accept charity in my life. I thought I would be able to take care of my family, but I'm grateful for everyone who has provided charity to me. That even includes a former colleague's uh, church. I would name the church to give them recognition, but I'm too worried that the FBI would send informants to infiltrate that church as well. Yeah, well, they've already done that with the Catholics. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from North Dakota is recognized. Seconds to the gentlelady from Indiana. A quick follow-up on CHS one from page 243, who, according to your report, created conspiracy allegation in direct conflict with his recording and misstated significant material fact to the FBI, among other things, and you are unable to establish his intent. Would you be able to provide to the committee a recording of your CHS one interview on April 6, 2021, per page 192, and any other interviews in your possession? Yes or no? Um. I'm, did you refer to page 43? I'm sorry if I can just find on page 43. Page 92, would you provide the recording to the committee that you list? Yes or no? The recording with confidential human source one, I think, is what she's asking about. Oh, and and um, she, she would like that provided. She's asking if that could be provided to the committee, Mr. Uh, Mr. Durham. I mean, it's a piece of um, evidence uh, that belongs to the FBI. I think probably that's better directed to the FBI. Uh, okay. okay. Re reclaiming yeah. my time, uh, Mr. Durham. This seems to all started with one person, but I don't see his name in your report. I see it in Mueller's report 89 times. Who did Mr. Papadopoulos meet with that, that gave him this supposed Russian information? When Mr. Papadopoulos was interviewed by the FBI, um, he had identified Joseph Mifsud um, as a person who had provided him that information. Did you interview Joseph Mifsud? We attempted to um, interview him. Uh, we pursued um, every lead that we had. We talked to a lawyer that he had in Europe, but we never were able to actually make contact is, with him so do, we could interview him. Do you think he's a, a, a Western source? Is he associated with Western intelligence? Um, it's hard to say who Mr. Mifsud is associated with. He was tied up with Link University. Um, Mr. Scotti, who had um, involvement in the Italian government, and um, they were Acquainted. I, um, it's hard to say who Mifsa is. I'm, I'm going to yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Gates. Hard to say who Mifsud is. He's the guy who started the whole thing. We've known it for years. Go ahead and play the video. When the special counsel's office interviewed Mifsud, did he lie to you guys too? Can't get into that. Did you interview Mifsud? Can't get into that. Is Mifsud Western intelligence Can't or Russian intelligence? That. Can't get into that. Well, I'm reading from your report. Mifsud told Papadopoulos, Papadopoulos tells the diplomat, the diplomat tells the FBI, the FBI opens the investigation July 31st, 2016, and here we are three years later, July of 2019, the country's been put through this, and the central figure who launches it all lies to us, and you guys don't hunt him down and interview him again, and you don't charge him with a crime. Maybe a better course of action is to figure out how the false accusation started. Maybe it's to go back and actually figure out why Joseph Mifsud was lying to the FBI. And here's the good news. Here's the good news. That's exactly what Bill Barr is doing. And thank goodness for that. That's exactly what the Attorney General and John Durham are doing. Well, Mr. Durham, was that what you were doing? It, I'm sorry, is that what? Was finding out who Mifsud was what you were doing? We pursued um, that avenue, yes. Right, but was he... This whole thing was an op, Mr. Durham. This wasn't like a bumbling, fumbling FBI that like, couldn't get FISA straight. They ran an op. So who put Mifsud in play? You don't know, do you? I do not know that. I can't but give you the answer. For years, you had years to find out the answer to what Mr. Jordan said was the seminal question, and you don't have it. And it, it, just, it just begs the question whether or not you were really trying to find that out. Because it's one thing... To, to criticize the FBI for their FISA violations, to write a report. They've been criticized in plenty of reports. Some have referred to your work as just a repackaging and regurgitation of what the Inspector General already told us. So if you, if you weren't going to do what Mr. Jordan said you were going to do in that video and give us the basis for all of it, what's this all been about? Well, I'm not exactly sure the import of your question. If, if your question is, 
Did we try to locate an interview Mr. Mifsud, the answer is yes. Why didn't you subpoena him? We expended. Wait, why didn't you subpoena him to a grand jury? I'm sorry, why not? Why didn't you send him a grand jury subpoena? Mr. Mifsud? You'd have to find Mr. Mifsud before you could serve a grand jury subpoena on him. Well, you guys were out in Italy. Was it you and Bill Barr looking for authentic pasta over there or Mifsud? No, we, uh, we not. Um, we were looking for information that might help us locate Mifsud. But you know who I think could probably locate him? The features of, uh, of Western intelligence and possibly our own government that put him in play. Like, your report seems to be less a, an indictment of the FBI and more of an inoculation, lowercase i, of course. And like many inoculations, it may have worse consequences down the road. I, we'll have some time to discuss this matter further, but it's just, hard, it's just hard to, like, pretend as though this was a sincere effort when you don't get to the fundamental thing that started the whole deal. I yield back. I was away from my family for four years, so essentially doing this investigation is my view is a sincere effort. The fact that you can't find somebody overseas um, should not come as a big Re surprise. Well, could you me. find Azra Sir? Re reclaiming my time, is he alive or dead? This can respond. I'm not, I'm not sure there was a, <clears throat> a question at the end. Okay. No. Okay. I know, I'm just giving you an opportunity I was, was going to, I didn't get there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Yeah, I, I agree with Mr. Biggs. You've given us testimony today that you're disappointed that the FBI didn't cooperate more, right? That was your testimony. I said that. Yeah, so we're disappointed too, but the difference is when regular folks do things that are wrong and unlawful, there's typically greater effort to try to get those people before a grand jury to, to utilize criminal process where appropriate, not, not for other purposes. And it's just like, oh, well, Bill Priestep, the guy who might have set this whole op in motion, he just didn't want to talk to you about certain things, and you were real accommodating to that. And then Mifsud, the person who juices Papadopoulos to create this predicate that you find improper. You guys, you, I mean, did you ever know who his lawyer was, Mifsud's lawyer? He talked to his lawyer in Europe. Not a, I don't know if so he wait, wait, You could find the guy's United lawyer, States. but you couldn't find him? We uh, contacted uh, somebody that we knew had, had, rep had represented him, and it, it part of the effort to try to locate him. And you got the lawyer. And then now you're, you're sitting here in front of the judiciary saying you could find the guy's lawyer, but you couldn't effectuate the service of a subpoena because you couldn't find him? Well, do you, first do you know how of silly all, that sounds? as you may or may not know, we wouldn't have um, the authority to serve a subpoena overseas. Um, the lawyer didn't know where Mifsud was. He was in communication uh, with him, but he claimed not to know where he was. And we were trying to arrange um, an opportunity to talk to Mifsud. Did you take uh, possession of two BlackBerry phones from Mifsud? in any way? There were phones that were provided to us by oh, So you could find Mr. the phones with the guy. Correct. Do you see how silly this looks? Like you found the lawyer, you found the phones, but the actual dude who yeah. got ordered by Western intelligence to go start this thing you couldn't find? It, it, it's it's kind of laughable. It seems like more than disappointment. It seems like you weren't really trying to expose the true core of the corruption, mm -hmm. that you were, trying to, you were trying to go at it another way. As we said in the um, report, and as I said in my opening remarks, <clears throat> we pursued the facts as best we could. Well, how about this fact? That we have. Okay, how about this fact, Mr. Durham? The entire Mueller team does a hard reset on their Apple phone in synchronization to wipe away evidence. Did you investigate that? I've read that. Well, why didn't, did you investigate it? Who gave the order on the Mueller team to, to wipe the phones? Yeah, that was not something that we were... Um, asked to look at, and we well, didn't. No, look that's at that. not true, Mr. Durham. That is not true because I'm holding the document that authorizes your activity, and it specifically says the investigation of Special Counsel Robert Mueller. It's in par Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record the order that says that no you're objection. supposed to inter investigate these things. And so, like, whether it's the Mueller team, Mifsud, how about Azra Turk? Azra Turk, what's Azra Turk's real name? Do you know that? I'm not going to be disclosing the names of FBI personnel that are oh, otherwise unavailable. But, but an FBI, so the FBI sends somebody to go honeypot George Papadopoulos. Who gave the order to do that? I think that's beyond the scope of what's in the report. It's literally the scope of what your charging order is. Who put it in motion? We get after it was put in motion, the FBI did a bunch of wrong and corrupt things. Totally understand we're trying to deal with that. But when you are part of the cover-up, Mr. Durham, mm. then it makes our job harder. Yeah, well, if that's your thought, I mean, there's no way of dissuading you from that. I can tell you that it's offensive and that the people who worked on this investigation have spent their lives trying to protect the people in this country. 
and pursue within the law you went what it is that we, two, could, we are authorized John, wait, to do. You tried two cases, lost both of them, and then the one plea, guilty plea you got, Kleinsmith, Kleinsmith is back to practicing law in Washington, D.C. today. Yeah, that's beyond my control. Right, but, but the, the fact that you allowed that plea to occur, yeah. right, and, and then the punishment was insufficient, the fact that you didn't, you didn't charge Andrew McCabe, you didn't convict the Lion Democrats or the Lion Russians, you didn't investigate Mifsud or the Mueller probe, even though, as we sit here today in black letter, that was your charge. Uh, have you ever heard of the Washington Generals? Uh, the Washington Generals, yes. Yeah, and, and they're the team that basically gets paid to show up and lose, right? <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm sure that the players who um, exert blood, sweat, and tears don't view it that way, but you might. I think they do. I think they do because the job of the Washington generals is to show up every night and to play the Harlem Globetrotters. And their job well, I'm is thinking, to lose. I'm sorry, of a different, I was thinking of a different Yeah, thing. yeah, so their job is to lose. And I'm kind of wondering, and, and it, just seem, it just seems so facially obvious that it's not what's in your report that's telling it's the omission. It's the lack of work you did. And for the people like the chairman who put trust in you, I think you let them down. I think you let the country down. And you are one of the barriers to the true accountability that we need. Do I get okay. to respond to that or comment on that? Yeah. Well, I don't know if you've ever investigated a crime. Um, if you I don't know that you have. Did, you didn't investigate these, Mr. Yeah. Durham. What, whether or How not. How about Andy McCabe? Did you charge him? Do you yeah. investigate him? Gentlemen, gentlemen, time has expired. The witness can respond, and then we'll move on to our last uh, last. I don't know, day. sir, whether or not you've ever had occasion to... Uh, try to investigate crimes under the rules and regulations and under the Constitution that we're bound by. Um, we can gather evidence in particularly lawful ways. Um, can't charge people because we might think it's something. It's not just that we you didn't charge, charge you didn't investigate. Gentlemen, gentlemen, you didn't time. investigate the Mueller team gentlemen's wiping time. their phones, gentlemen's and you won't time. tell us who gave the orders because you're protecting those people. Gentlemen's time has expired. The, um, the gentlelady from Wyoming is recognized. Mr. Durham, <clears throat> in reviewing your report, I since Gentlemen, Mr. Gates is recognized. I would simply observe that George Washington was also a believer in natural immunity. Were there people who had had smallpox and could demonstrate it, the readiness of the force was put above uh, any type of mandate or requirement. Our Secretary of Defense currently doesn't seem to have that same belief, and the consequence has been devastating for our military. I'm voting for Mr. Jackson's amendment and all the amendments that uh, allow for a reinstatement and additional remedies that we'll define here for our service members, because we're not a stronger military as a consequence of this vaccine mandate. When we've asked people in force posture hearings again and again before this committee, are we stronger without the hundreds of pilots, without the special operators? without the people in the guard and the reserves that have been driven out, time and again, they indicate the parts of our mission that suffer as a result of that. So this is about readiness, and it's about undoing the tremendous harm that's been done to these service members by a, a frankly, very ill-supported vaccine mandate. I yield back. Chair not recognizes the ranking member. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, the military could also be asked if they think a military is stronger if the service members think orders are optional. I think they would all be pretty unanimous in saying, no, if you can't have service members who are following orders, you are going to be decidedly weaker. Second, I want to emphasize the point that Mr. Ryan made. This affects, at the moment, exactly two, as I understand it, service academy members, and in both instances, the Secretary of Defense has exercised their option to waive this requirement. So this is a solution in search of a problem. And then lastly, we don't really want to relitigate. We've had the last two years ar ar arguing over the COVID, the COVID vaccine mandates, but it is absolutely undeniable that vaccination saved I don't know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives worldwide um, and reduced the spread of the disease. There is simply no debate that the vaccine had that impact. And that was the judgment that was made. And to the sponsor of this amendment's point, once the pandemic was done, it didn't make sense at that point to have the vaccine mandate. That's what I said last year. It's a rational approach. In the height of the pandemic, with everything that was going on, it made an enormous amount of sense to have the mandate. It was a carefully considered decision. And I think the most offensive thing about this debate is the implication that it was political. Believe me, the military didn't want to do this, all right? They didn't want to lose these service members and start an argument. 
but the science told them this was, was going to best protect the force. So they made that decision, and then a number of people ignored it. Not that many, actually. So they decided that there had to be consequences for ignoring that order. That's what they did. That's the way the military is supposed to run. When the circumstances change, this committee in Congress recognized that, and we moved the mandate. But we can all agree that when we did that, the pandemic was done, and it was an entirely different set of circumstances. As I said, this is really about, does this committee want to tell service members that they don't have to obey lawful orders? I don't think we should. So I oppose this amendment as well. I yield back. Is there any further discussion? There's no further debate questions on the amendment offered uh, by Mr. Jackson. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Bench here, the ayes have it. All right. The, uh, we will now consider uh, log number 3276 uh, by Mr. Mills. For what purpose? Yeah, a recorded vote is requested on Mr. Jackson's amendment, and uh, it, will, it will be postponed. Now what? Okay. We, we will now consider log number 3276 by Mr. Mills. Uh, I reserve the right to object to this amendment. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from uh, Florida seek recognition? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, bring the amendment to the table, 3726. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first want to approach the fact that many of us could not have seen the foreseen circumstances which occurred when we did have the COVID outbreak. But I think it's arguable to say that in many ways it was handled very poorly when it came to our United States military and our armed forces. And as a result of that, we've seen an absolute purging of our United States military as a result of this up to 8,600 to add into the already 25,000 deficit. My amendment would prevent the Department of Defense from forcing our service members who were unconstitutionally removed from the military to not have their actual signing bonuses be forced to be paid back. The idea that these members who signed up to actually serve our armed forces and not serve the political agendas of others are now being forced to pay back their signing bonuses is absolutely absurd. This amendment is necessary to prevent the Department of Defense from doubling down on their wrongful treatment of our service members and for those who declined the COVID vaccine. Service members were already wrongfully forced to take the vaccine, and then after they refused, was removed altogether. I look forward to bringing this up on the floor, and as a result of the scoring system, which is very unfortunate, I will have to withdraw the following amendment. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Florida. I strongly support his amendment, but we do have a scoring problem, so I appreciate his withdrawal of it. Uh, we will now consider amendment number 3557R1 by Mr. Gates. Uh, for what purposes does the gentleman seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please distribute the amendment without objection to reading of the amendments dispensed with? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida for the purpose of explaining his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When we had the Secretary of Defense before us, I asked him whether or not uh, he would be able to develop a plan uh, to bring back to the committee so that we had active re-engagement uh, and re-enlistment of those who were harmed by the vaccine mandate. He said he could write that plan, so this directs him to do that. That's the amendment, Mr. Chairman. Is there mission for being such great hosts and uh, allowing us to gather here to conduct our business today. From time to time, members of Congress host field hearings on a variety of matters. And uh, I can say that Congresswoman Green and I have been involved in field hearings on illegal immigration, on spending, on civil rights, on China, on House rules. And these hearings allow us to be able to establish a record that we can then use in the committees upon which we serve in the Congress. Uh, Congresswoman Green serves on the Oversight Committee, which has taken a particular in interest in the subject matter that we will be discussing today. And I serve on the House Judiciary Committee, where we have oversight over the Department of Justice and the ATF as well. Uh, we can use and will use the content and clips from our discussion today uh, during committee debates. You may have seen recently when we had Special Counsel Durham before the Judiciary Committee, I used clips that had been developed in prior hearings uh, to be able to elicit answers. 
And we also make a record so that in the internal meetings and caucuses of the members of Congress, we're able to persuade people to our viewpoints. And, and as we gather here today, members of Congress are receiving feedback on important matters such as this because we are upon the appropriations process where I know Congresswoman Green and I have great interest in ensuring that the resources of our government are not directed uh, at entities that have been weaponized against our people. And uh, so before I, I give my full opening statement, we'd actually like to play a video uh, reflecting on, on some of the discussions that we've had in Congress on these matters. 16 federal ATF agents were met with questions and skepticism by four Georgia members of Congress. I just introduced the bill to eliminate the ATF. The war on gun owners' rights has been waged long enough and it's time to stop it. Why should you be able to destroy the life of one of my constituents over a technicality where they weren't even at fault when you all lose thousands of guns and illegally keep hundreds of thousands of records? Congress has, has given us uh, the authority to inspect. You have imposed a zero tolerance policy that is resulting in the highest rate of revocations in 16 years, and you wouldn't be able to meet your own zero tolerance policy because you lose stuff you're supposed to keep, and then you keep stuff that it's illegal to keep. ATF Director Steve Diedelbach have weaponized the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms against law-abiding American citizens in order to facilitate a radical anti-gun agenda. The Second Amendment is what stands between Americans and anarcho-tyranny, and many know this. Increasingly across the country, as Soros-backed prosecutors are installed with orders to stop prosecuting violent crime and criminalize self-defense, so too has the ATF been dispatched to make sure that Americans are not in a position to defend themselves. And increasingly the strategy we have observed and that we will discuss today involves targeting firearms dealers. Uh, at recently when we had our open gates day and I was in Baker, Florida having a cheeseburger at the Gator Cafe, the folks just a table over were FFL dealers and didn't even know I would be there but had their own story of, of harassment and overreach and abuse of power by the ATF. Later that day when I was in Jay, Florida, I met with a, a local businessman, mom and pop shop, walked into his library, showed me a picture of his grandfather and a picture of his father, both of whom had run that firearms business. And he said one day he wanted to have his photo and his son's photo on that very same wall. And they are currently enduring administrative hearings to take away their licenses because on three forms, a clerk under county, misread county as country, and put United States of America instead of Santa Rosa County. And for that grave offense, this multi-generational business is at risk of losing their license. President Biden and Steve Diedelbach know that all-out gun confiscation is unfeasible, nearly impossible. So instead, they're going after the sellers and manufacturers of firearms. They want to make it impossible to exercise Second Amendment rights, and what better way to do this than to make it difficult to purchase a firearm? Make no mistake, the ATF is going after Americans, and FFLs are just in the way. In the last two years, FFL re revocations are the highest they have been in 16 years. Joe Biden and Director Diedelbach's zero-tolerance policy is an overt and outrageous attempt to criminalize bookkeeping, According to their policy, perfection is the new business standard, and a good faith clerical error made in a typo and a date is enough to revoke a firearms license. This standard does not require any intent. Nowhere in our justice system is such a standard found. Nowhere will you pay such a high price for a good faith and negligible error, not to mention that the error may be the result of trying to comply with erroneous and confusing red tape. This standard is unconscionable, unconstitutional, and an affront to the rule of law in our country. Federal firearm licensees all over the country are now being targeted by the ATF, and right here in our district in Northwest Florida, we see that occurring as well. Numerous constituents have been targeted and harassed for no reason at all. The ATF comes in and tries to put them out of business, and I know Congresswoman Green will speak to that dynamic in Georgia as well. Many of these constituents are so terrified about retaliation, and rightly so, that they could not be here today. 
but two of my constituents, Chris Smith and Miles Schuler, are here today, and I thank them for their advocacy and for standing up for their rights and for standing up for their customers as well and their rights. I hope that their testimony will embolden others who are watching to come forward and provide us critical evidence in this endeavor. Just last week, the IRS raided a Montana gun shop and confiscated ATF forms 4473, which contained personally identifying information of firearm purchasers, as well as the serial numbers of firearms that were purchased. The warrant was for fi financial records, but these ATF forms were confiscated even though they were outside of the scope. No one can deduce that these records will make their way to the ATF to join the nearly one billion records already in the possession of the ATF that are being digitally transferred to searchable databases in contradiction to existing statute and the DOJ's own directives. This unconstitutional database is still in effect today despite the Government Accountability Office reprimand to the ATF in 2016 for maintaining this database and not adhering to their own standards. The history of the ATF is fraught with misconduct. Since 2015, thousands of guns have been stolen from the ATF's National Disposal Branch. Recently, the ATF has been caught routinely misclassifying bureaucrats as law enforcement officers, improperly costing taxpayers millions of dollars in additional pay and enhanced benefits that's supposed to be going to law enforcement officers. The ATF has even been known for setting up entrapment stings around the country and here in Florida, taking advantage of mentally disabled people in order to sell guns to criminals with the hope of tracking those guns. And they often lose track. This agency is an absolute clown show masquerading as a law enforcement bureau. Not to be outdone by past transgression, their latest bureaucratic assault on the Second Amendment is horrifying. The ATF's new rule, criminalizing pistol braces, is a brazen attempt to usurp congressional authority over our nation's laws, and they are abusing their rulemaking powers. I believe that this pistol brace rule will fail for the same reason the bump stock rule failed. The ATF does not have the authority to create federal law. This new rule will ban pistol, pistol braces on certain firearms, forcing users to jump through numerous hoops to comply with this decree or risk becoming a felon. Tens of millions of Americans could be affected. Disabled veterans, many of whom live in Northwest Florida, have used these braces for years to help them fire these pistols, enhance their mental health, engage in recreation and sports shooting. Now these law-abiding Americans, many of whom are patriots and heroes, will have to destroy their newly illegal firearm or figure out how to comply with arbitrary and confusing regulations outlined in the National Firearms Act. I'm not sure if the ATF really knows what this entails, but I sure know that Director Diedelbach doesn't know because he contradicted himself in testimony before the House Judiciary Committee. If a private citizen did a quarter of what the ATF does on a yearly basis, they would be thrown in prison for the rest of their life. The ATF may be beyond reform. It's a prime directive, and it's unconstitutional and diametrically opposed to Americans' rights to bear arms increasingly in their actions. There's no immediate timetable in which the ATF might become an ally of law-abiding Americans. Even under Republican administrations, the ATF has become an enemy of firearm owners without enhancing public safety. This is why we are leading the fight, along with Congressman Roman Green, to defund and abolish the ATF, and I urge my members who cherish their rights to look for ways to empower our local law enforcement, to empower state law enforcement, to be able to utilize other assets uh, to get away from an agency that seems to have lost its way. Uh, Congresswoman Green, I now recognize you for your opening statement. Uh, thank you very much. The American people need to understand what just happened. My, exactly. my Democrat colleague just asked the director of the FBI whether or not they are buying information about our fellow Americans. And the answer is, well, we'll just have to get back to you on that. It sounds really complicated. But I have other questions. I'm sitting here with my father. I will make certain that between the man sitting next to me and every person he knows and my ability to forever hold a grudge, that you will regret not following my direction. I am sitting here waiting for the call with my father. Sounds like a shakedown, doesn't it, Director? I'm not going to get into commenting on that.
You, you, you seem deeply uncurious about it, don't you? Almost suspiciously uncurious. Are you protecting the Bidens? Absolutely not. The FBI well, does not the has no oh, hold interest on. in protecting You won't protecting answer the question about whether or not that's a shakedown, and everybody knows why you won't answer it. Because to, ev to the millions of people who will see this, they know it is. And your inability to acknowledge that is deeply revealing about you. But let's go from the uncurious to the downright nosy. How many illegal FISA queries have occurred under your leadership of the FBI? Well, there are reports that have come out with different numbers about uh, compliance incidents. More than a million illegal ones? Because that's what the Inspector General said. The Inspector General said that in the 3.4 million of these queries, more than a million were in error. Do you have any basis to disagree with that, that assessment by the Inspector General? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, actually, that's a, com a correct characterization of the Inspector General's uh, oh, well, findings on well, that. Well, the Internet will remind you of I, that in moments. But, but let, let's now go to uh, what the, the court said. The court said it was over 200,000 that have occurred on your watch. W would, do you have any basis to disagree with that assessment? Again, I don't have the numbers I sit here right now. What I can Seems like you a number you should know. How many times the FBI is breaking the law under your watch, especially if it's like over a million to not know that number. And I'm worried about your veracity on the subject as well. Play, this, play the video. Letters for investigation the of court? the Capitol. I don't believe FISA is remotely implicated in our investigation. Were you, you so, so there, Senator Lee's asking you whether or not FISA was in any way involved in your January 6th investigation, and you say no. It, was that truthful? I said that I did not believe it was. Okay, so now let's pull up what the court said, which was something a little different than what you said. So, so here, no, nope, that's not the right one. Yeah, here we go, right there. It says, the government has reported additional significant violations of the querying standard, including several relating to the January 6, 2021 breach of the Capitol. So I guess the question, Director Ray, is did, did you not know when you were answering these questions that the FBI was engaging in these illegal searches, or did you perjure yourself to Senator Lee? I certainly didn't perjure myself. At the time that I testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, I didn't have that piece of information. I will add... Well, that was a court order. You didn't have that piece of information because the court hadn't yet rendered a judgment. Did you not know when you gave the untruthful answer before Senator Lee that this was going on? It was a, it was a truthful answer. I did not believe FISA had been involved in the January 6th But it was. So you didn't... The answer is the FBI has broken so bad that people can go and engage in queries that when you come before the Congress to answer questions, you're like blissfully ignorant. You're blissfully ignorant as to the unlawful queries. You're blissfully ignorant as to the Biden shakedown regime. And it just seems like it gets into a kind of a creepy place as well. Go to our, our next image on what the court said. Like, just so the American people realize, the, the court has smacked you down, alleging or ruling FBI personnel apparently conducted queries for improper personal reasons. People were looking themselves up. They were looking their ex-lovers up. Who has been held accountable or fired as a consequence of the FBI using the FISA process as their like creepy personal snoop machine? There have been instances in which individuals uh, have had disciplinary action uh, and Amen. who are no longer with it. I, I can't get into it here, but we can follow back up but with don't you. But you yeah. don't you see that that's kind of the thing, Director Ray, that you preside over the FBI that has the lowest level of trust in the FBI's history? People trusted the FBI more when J. Edgar Hoover was running the place than when you are. And the reason is because you don't give straight answers. You give answers that, that later a court deems aren't true. And then at the end of the day, you won't criticize an obvious shakedown when it's directly in front of us. And it appears as though you're whitewashing the conduct of corrupt people. Respectfully, Congressman, in your home state of Florida, the number of people applying to come work for us and devote their lives working for us is over up over 100%. We're deeply I proud started. of them, and they deserve better than you. Time of the gentleman has expired. The, the gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for five minutes. You are a brilliant woman with a tremendous ability to impact how consumers are going to interface with the digital world for a long time to come. And I want to get to those areas of agreement, but there is some ugliness we got to deal with. Now, you guys putting in the names of reporters in a correspondence to Twitter 
was solely predicated based on anonymous news sources, right? It was based on reporting that we Right, and, and we would agree that anonymous reporting is not a sufficient predicate for, to target, you know, to send letters about journalists who are your critics, right? Congressman, yeah, I mean, you know, the goal was third parties, but this is good feedback for us. We want to make sure we're not in any way suggesting that we're interested in, you know, affecting journalists' work. It's really about privacy and security. So well, I really I appreciate, I appreciate your, your acknowledgement that that is not the way we ought to do things. As, you know, someone who has seen govern ugly government action emerge out of anonymous reporting, perhaps I'm a little sensitive to that, but I'm glad that um, you've made that acknowledgement. Let's get on to the important work that you are doing. Millions of Americans have ring doorbell cameras. And your agency recently, set, recently put out um, a, a, a correspondence saying, quote, during a three-month period in 2017, a Ring employee viewed thousands of videos of female users in their bedrooms and bathrooms, including videos of Ring's own employees. There was also at Ring, according to the FTC, an unauthorized tunnel that allowed a Ukraine-based contractor to access consumer videos, an incident where a Ring employee gave information about a customer's to their ex-husband was also something that you uncovered. You also state that bad actors at Ring took advantage of the camera's two-way communication functionality to harass and threaten people who used Ring cameras. There was a case where an 87-year-old woman at an assisted living facility was sexually propositioned through Ring's two-way two features. Kids were subject to racial slurs. A hacker got in and threatened a family with physical harm if they did not pay a Bitcoin ransom. And one hacker even communicated through the two-way feature to a customer that they had already killed the customer's mother and, quote, tonight you die. What is going on at Ring? So as you noted, we recently took enforcement action precisely because of these very serious lapses uh, in data privacy, which endangered Americans in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, overall, you know, looking at some of these surveillance devices and how they can be misused and abused is a top area of focus for us because people's privacy is paramount. Yeah, I, I thought that when people got Ring, it was to enhance their personal security, not to have their 87-year-old relative in an ALF sexually propositioned, their children to be slurred at, and then to be told that they were going to be killed if they didn't pay Bitcoin ransom. So thank you for that effort. Let's go to another evil company, Kochava. Kochava is uh, one of these data brokers that you're going after, right? That's right. And the American people should know that Kochava geolocates where people go to church, and then they sell that data to commercial enterprises, right? That's right. That's real creepy, isn't it? I believe most people would have that reaction, yes. I got onto the FBI director yesterday yeah. for their creepy FISA activity, and now we have Kochava literally selling to people, oh, well, this is a Baptist, this is a method, this is someone who goes to temple. Are you going to get these people and stop them? So we have a pending uh, lawsuit. We filed it last year. Uh, the court dismissed it. They gave us the opportunity to refile. We just refiled an amended complaint. Uh, and we think it's urgent to act here because, you know, the types of stigmatization and harms that can stem from being able to track and sell people's sensitive geolocation information is just critical for us to be addressed. We didn't like it when the FBI was wanting to infiltrate the Catholic churches. And I don't know that I want the data brokers to do the same. And by the way, we've even seen how the FBI is using the data brokers to do an end run around the Fourth Amendment. So I really want to encourage your work in this space. And I hope that your litigation against Kochava is, an, is something that creates precedent. And you know what? If it, There's been criticism of some of your losses in court, but we as sophisticated lawyers know sometimes that a motion to dismiss an initial complaint can create a pathway to an amended complaint to achieve relief. And so if the laws are insufficient to stop data brokers from selling information about where my constituents worship, and if the laws are insufficient to stop Ring from these activities, I really hope you'll work with us to change those laws. And all of Mr. Buck's points are, are really central to this because if Congress is bought off, if people are just to come in here to beat you up over what email account you use or what trip you've been on to Europe, I think it misses these things that are far more central to the life that our constituents lead. Thank you for your work.
I would just say worse than Coach Chavez selling. It's the FBI is probably buying it. That's the scariest part. So agree with I, both. I, I appreciate. Well, let's uh, get a bill, Mr. Chairman, to deal with those data brokers. We're, we're gonna we're working with uh, the gentlelady who just went right before you to uh, to do just that. Um, that 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 is something that I think this committee can uh, can hopefully agree on. The and I, I neglected to mention this earlier, Madam Chair. Um, we've been at this hour and a half. If you need a break at any time, just let us know. If not, well, we can keep going because we can get up and leave, but you can't. So you let us know if you need a break. With that, if, you can, if you're willing to keep going, we'll go to the gentlelady for, from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Ms. Goitine, many of my constituents will watch this hearing and they'll say, well, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, I'm not a foreigner. Why should that bother me? What would you say? Americans' communications are swept up in enormous volumes, so enormous that the government won't tell us how big it is because it would be a very awkward number for the government to disclose. I suspect that's the real reason. Um, and those communications are available to FBI agents without a warrant or court order of any kind. And uh, you talked about these backdoor searches, and that's been an intense focus of the committee. Uh, could you help define that for folks so they understand the, the risk there? Sure, what a backdoor search is, is an electronic query of data obtained under Section 702. So the communications are obtained, they are placed into data systems um, at the NSA and then shared with the FBI, the National Counterterrorism S uh, Center, and the CIA. Um, and then agents can run electronic queries of those data systems using identifiers associated with Americans, so using an American's email address, for example. They can plug that in, and that will return any communications that were obtained under Section 702 that have an American on one end of them. And it almost feels like there's a digital file out there about millions of Americans, uh, and, and I'm sort of wondering how, and we've tried to get straight answers uh, from folks who, who work in the government about this question, but what we've learned is it's upwards of 10,000 people who can conduct some of these backdoor searches. Have any of your studies um, evaluated the breadth of individuals who can engage in this violation of our civil liberties? No, we don't know the number, but I think... Isn't that scary? Shouldn't we? I mean, it seems like something we should know. Uh, how many people can do backdoor searches into information that was not collected pursuant to any probable cause or a warrant? Yeah, it would be a good thing to know. And one of the reasons why I think we should be curious about it is because uh, the government has told the FISA court that one of the reasons for all of these violations we've seen is that FBI agents didn't understand the standard for those searches. And that standard is that the search has to be reasonably likely to obtain foreign intelligence or evidence of a crime. Well, and that I, doesn't sound like rocket science to me, and that standard has been in place for 15 years. But they, they break it. Well, I mean, I just read an order from the foreign intelligence, the, the FISC, the court, and the court said, well, you weren't just using these searches and queries to get legitimate law enforcement information. At times, people at the FBI were searching themselves, searching their ex-lovers, searching their neighbors uh, in this system. Um, and, and so it, it seems as though they're not really, there's not a standard that's ad adhered to. It's adhered to often in the breach. There were 278,000 yeah. violations of that standard in 2021. It, I mean, if, if you've got 278,000 violations of the standard, the, as you've said, the breach is the standard in a lot of ways. So we have this tactical question coming up. We have FISA that is set to expire, and I believe we should let it. I believe it. Does it, it, the, the standard of violation of breach is so pervasive that the patient is not savable, that we have to design something totally different outside of 702. And then I have other colleagues who are, who are like-minded in my desire to protect civil liberties, but who suggest tactically that the best approach is to try to insert strong warrant requirements. This is my seventh year in, in Congress, Mr. Kiko. I certainly don't have your experience, but I want to draw on it because I, I want to get your advice. I've gone down this road with the Cheneyistas and, and, and others who um, bring us to the precipice of reform, and then at the last moment, it seems as though the civil libertarians uh, rarely prevail over those who, who purport to be defending national security no matter how many violations of our liberties occur. And so would you advise uh, a reform effort or an expiration uh, strategy and, and why? That's a very tough question. 
and I know that's why you ask it. And I would, I can actually see my preference would be some kind of reform effort with teeth and accountability because there hasn't been any teeth and there hasn't been any accountability in, in the oversight that's been conducted. We're always at the end of the system. They say they're going to do something. It never gets done. Four years later, we find out there's massive yeah. violations. Everybody comes, well, we're going to do it this time. But there's no accountability among the people that are breaking the law. There's no accountability among the administration. It doesn't matter. There's nothing. Yeah, it sounds like there need to be penalties. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Thank you. Chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady, the ranking member, Ms. Jackson Lee. A diverse and inclusive force is a war fighting imperative. This is on a slide at the Air Force Academy. General Clark, do you agree with that statement? I do agree with that statement, sir. So, I mean, were, were the Mongols diverse? Well, sir, uh, I, I'm not really uh, as versed on Mongol warfighting as how I about, am on how about the U.S. Vikings? war fighting. Were the Vikings diverse? Again, sir, I'm looking at our country, the most diverse country in the world. Sure, sure, but this is about a war fighting imperative. How about the, fight, the force in Ukraine? Are the Ukrainians fighting the Russians a diverse force? Sir, once again, uh, my concern is the people that I'm charged to build into leaders. The right, but you would, you would acknowledge that throughout history, including present history, that statement hasn't borne true in every example, right? Sir, what I would say is that those countries have to rely on the full force of their population to, to build a war fighting force yeah. to win our wars, and that's why it's important for us to be diverse, because sure, our nation... So let's look at the population that actually makes up the, the, the fighting force frequently. Now, we have more w men than women, right? 70, 30-ish? That's right. correct. And, and of the men we have, most of them are not transgender men. Most of them are cisgender men, right? Uh, yes, sir. But yet, at our academies, we pu push something called the Brooke Owens Fellowship. Are you familiar with that? I am, yes, sir. And in that fellowship, it specifically says, if you are a cisgender man, this program isn't for you. So you just said that your answer on why we, why we do such this, this full hug of these diversity concepts is because it's all about the fighting force that we draw from, but you, you're literally pushing a program in the academies that says, if you're a cisgender woman, a transgender woman, a non-binary, agender, bigender, two-spirit, demigender, what's demigender? Sir, that's, a, uh, that's a, a, a term of the people that are eligible for that particular scholarship that yeah, is available a person? to, it's a person who looks at their gender in a, in a, different, uh, a different way than I do, sir. Well, sure, that's all so. of these people. You're a cisgender man, you don't even get to apply. Well, do you know what gen demigender really means? I, I'm not really sure, sir. Right. So, do you know what agender means? All one word, not a space gender, but agender. Uh, sir, I don't. Right. So, here we are pushing a fellowship, calling for people that you don't even know what the words mean. And the number one group of people, the cisgender men, are excluded. Now, in the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion, should we be pushing programs that we can't define that exclude the largest group of service members? Well, sir, first, that uh, program is not an Air Force Academy program. It's a program open to our entire country. Right, so but we you, guys, allow, you guys advocate for it within the academy. We allow our cadets to apply for it. Why are you allowing your cadets to apply for a program when you cannot define the basic terms of eligibility? because it's an opportunity for us to develop them as warfighters, and we look for every opportunity that we can. But you don't even know what the words mean. How can to, you use this as a way to develop the warfighters if you don't know what it means? Well, some of those, those uh, terms may not be applicable to us at the Air Force Academy, but some are. But, but, so, but if, well, if you don't know what they mean, it's hard to tell if they're applicable or not. So I think one of the reasons why some of this stuff has gotten into the academies is because we don't have the same oversight from the Board of Visitors. And, Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, an article from the Washington Examiner entitled, To Push Woke Ideology, Biden Illegally Gutted Military Academy Oversights Boards. 
And so in this piece, it goes through a timeline where on September 8th, 2021, all of President Trump's appointees were fired. On September 17th, Secretary Austin created Board of Visitors subcommittees, and then he populated those subcommittees with people who weren't on the Board of Visitors. Have you ever seen that happen before? Sir, our Board of Visitors is populated and, uh, and supports us in great fashion. Right, so. what about the subcommittee? Are there people on the Board of Visitors subcommittees who are not on the Board of Visitors? I can't answer that, sir. Seems like something we ought to know. I, I'm, yes, sir. I'm not sure. Right, but here. that would be odd, right? I mean, here, okay, I'll, let me ask the question this way. You, you don't have any basis to disagree with the reporting here in the Washington Examiner that literally we have people who are not on the Board of Visitors who are serving on these subcommittees. You have no basis to disagree with that, do you? Uh, sir, I'm not exactly sure the question you're answer, asking. So I, so, I'll have to take well, that for record so I can understand what you're Look exactly forward to what you're asking. Hope. Thank you, Mr. Representative Escobar. Uh, I'd like to thank our panel for your service to our nation and for your the course of that 47 months. They don't necessarily come in as defined as such. We provide those skills and capabilities. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, Representative Gates. Let's put the slideshow back up that we were discussing earlier. This was at the Air Force Academy instructing students on how to use inclusive language. Uh, we had Secretary Kendall here, and when we got into the whole mom and dad thing, Secretary Kendall said, yeah, we probably aren't going to tell students they can't say mom and dad. That was inartful. So if there are other things here that are inartful that you want to disclaim, that's a totally reasonable thing for a person uh, to do. So I want to start with this contention that uh, to be inclusive, cadets would have to not use the term colorblind or say, we're all just people. Is there something wrong with aspiring to be colorblind in the United States military and particularly the Air Force Academy? Sir, I, I think it depends on um, how you use, how a person uses that term in, the, in context. I think that most people, if you're of a, a different race or a different color, that you don't want to be, you want to be seen for who you are. You don't want someone to look at you and not see, in my case, a black man, because that's who I am. I don't want you to be blind to that, but I want a person to accept that and to understand that and to include me as if they would include any other person that might be of a different color. Well, we as a country were in many ways educated on the concept of colorblindness through the civil rights movement. And in Dr. King's many remarks, he would talk about the virtue of judging one another, not by the color of our skin, not you as a black man, me as a white man, but by the content of our character. D do you worry that the Air Force's critique of colorblindness could be viewed as a critique of the very values that undergird the civil rights movement. I, I don't think so. I, I, in my interpretation of Doc, Dr. King's words, he's not saying don't recognize the color of a person. He's saying once you recognize it, don't judge them by that color. Didn't Dr. King explicitly call for color blindness? I think he called for what, what he said, don't, don't judge people right, but, by that. And that's what I meant. I, I want to use, because we're talking about specific terms and language. Right. So, Dr. King did explicitly call for colorblindness, right? Um, I'm, he, he may have. I'm not sure of what, when yeah, he did I'm that. Yeah, I'm just starting to think maybe, but, maybe instead of like teaching that we uh, shouldn't say boyfriend or girlfriend or mom or dad or whatever, maybe we should actually get back to the core of the values of the civil rights movement. Because if we learned about, you would be able to answer these questions more thoroughly if maybe we had a greater connection to the thoughts of Dr. King and maybe a little less Ibram X. Kendi. Um, what about the statement, we're all just people? W what's offensive about that? It's not that it's offensive, sir. My what's well, non-inclusive? Because this is saying not, underlined, not, we're all just people. So, so why is that a not? I, I thought we're all just people. That sounds inclusive to me. In the context that this slide was presented, what the uh, folks who presented it were saying was recognize people for who they are, that we don't always all look alike, that we're not always of the but, same But gender. why do the words we're all just people serve as an affront to that concept? Well, I think, I think the idea is that we, are all, we should all be treated 
as uh, equals. Uh, we should well, all what be about we're all just equals? people? Wait, but 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 I, well, I got to get you back to the words on on your okay. slide here. Yes, sir. So the words on your slide say we're all just people, and you say that's a bad thing because we have to say that we're all equal. Does that seem so circular to you? Well, I think in the context that it was presented, the slide is a is a bit out of context when you can't present it in the way that it was presented to the. I cadets. mean, I've gone through two of them. I'm providing as much context as I and as I can. Are 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 cadets um, are punished? if they talk about color blindness in a positive way? Absolutely Are not. they punished if they say boyfriend or girlfriend rather than partner? Absolutely not. Are they punished if they say the disabled as opposed to people with disabilities? They are not. Are they punished if they say transgenders instead of transgender people or service members? They are not. Are they punished if they say mom or dad instead of parents, caregivers, or guardians? They are not. Oh, okay then, so why are we teaching it? What we're teaching is to understand a person's context to understand how to talk to people within their context so as not to offend until you get to know your people. And that's yeah, how we build effective What teams. I think you have to realize is that when you critique colorblindness and when you critique statements like we're all just people, that, that is the divisive activity, that in the name of diversity and equity and inclusion, we see some of the most divisive rhetoric. I see my time's expired. I yield back. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Two million encounters and releases under your watch. So not including the Title 42 expulsions, not including violent criminals. Of those two million plus that you've encountered and released, how many have you told to go home? Um, uh, Congressman, uh, individuals who are released are placed in immigration enforcement proceedings under the law where they can make their claim for relief. If their claim for relief is not satisfied, they are subject to removal from the United right. States. Right, subject to removal sounds very different than actually removed. So I'm not interested in the process, I'm not interested in what people are subject to. Two million people encountered and released, not the expulsions under Title 42, not the criminals. How many of those people have you deported? So, uh, Congressman, a few points. Number one. Just how many of the people? I just want to know how many. It's just I a may. number. Congressman, uh, we are dealing with a completely broken immigration I get system. It. I, no, 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 Mr. Secretary, I'm not gonna let you burn my five minutes. Do you know the answer? Do you know the number of people out of that two million that you've removed that aren't criminals? I do know that okay. we have removed more aggravated felons. Right, I'm not asking about them. You, you, I, I've caveated that away. Because here's what I'm, I'm sort of getting and what your non-responsiveness is demonstrating. The Mayorkas doctrine is this. If you show up at the border and get released into the country, if you don't commit a specific aggravated felony, which by the way, doesn't include a lot of assault and battery, doesn't include a lot of bad domestic violence, but if you're not one of the people who commit those crimes, you get to stay forever. Is, is that a fair characterization of your doctrine? No, that is false. Then tell me how many you're sending home. No, that is false. Okay, well, they, but you don't know the number of how many you've sent home. Here's another number. Two point, I'm sorry, 1.2 million people today have been through your entire process. Right? They've been through what you call a removal proceeding is just an amnesty dance. Because after the 1.2 million people get an order from the judge saying that they don't have a basis to be here, you still don't remove them. Like, what's your plan to remove those people? Congressman, that is false. Okay, wh how many of them then? Just Cong give me the number. Congressman, in this country, in this country, there are between 11 and 12 million Right, but I'm asking about a subset that you won't send home. And the reason you're smirking about it and the reason you won't answer my question is because everybody gets the joke. And the sad thing is it's not just us here, it's the cartels who get the joke too. And so now what you've done to execute this Mayorkas doctrine where so long as you don't commit a crime, you get to stay here and burden our hospitals, burden our schools, burden our social services, burden our jails. You've sent the message to the cartels and then you've taken this app and you've digitized illegal immigration and you've scaled it to the moon. Like this app that you've got everybody downloading is like the Disney fast pass into the country, never to be subject to actual removal, just removal proceedings as you call them. That app doesn't do any search of their criminal history in their home country, does it? Congressman, I, I disagree with everything you have said. Well, I, I'm sure, but just to answer the question, does the app that you are out there promoting do any search of people's criminal history in their home country? Congressman. Customs and Border Protection screens and vets individuals whom they encounter. Your early. app, it either has the functionality 
to test their criminal history in their home country, or it doesn't. By the way, if it did, you'd have already told me. It doesn't. And then the other epic failure of this that's empowered the cartels is that in these processing centers you've set up in other countries to just wave them all in at a rapid pace, the, you've had to shut them down in Nuevo Laredo because the cartels were standing outside extorting people. Isn't that right? Congressman, that is false. Oh, really? So why did you shut down that facility in Nuevo Congressman, Laredo? Congressman, the, the point of safe, orderly, and lawful pathways is to reduce the number of encounters at our southwest border. But, but wait a second, you've, been, you, you, what, you've just shifted those encounters. Because right now, for the first time in modern history, more people are showing up at the ports of entry than running through some bush in Yuma, Arizona. And the reason they're showing up at the ports of entry is because you've got the turnstile open, where so long as they've gone and downloaded this app, you just let them in. I got one final question for you, and it's an important one. Is Mexico an ally in this fight against illegal immigration? Uh, yes, it is. So, I mean, it's hilarious and somewhat troubling that you say that, because like, I'm looking at the El Chapo trial, where President Nieto took a hundred million dollar bribe from the Sinaloa cartel. Do you think that the subsequent presidents following Nieto weren't offered a bribe by the cartel, or didn't take the bribe? Congressman, I, I disagree with everything you have said. Uh, right, right but, well, but you can disagree all you want, but what you won't provide is any number. And when, when you sit there and just kind of ostensibly disagree without any facts, it shows people what the real gig is. The Mexican government is captive to the cartels. They are doing the bidding of the cartels, and based on your response today, so are you. From Florida, Mr. Gates. So one reason people die from fentanyl is because they get addicted to opioids and get poisoned, right? Uh, y yes. And, and one reason that people get addicted to opioids is because they get prescribed opioids and that prescription turns into an addiction, right? So I would absolutely say the beginning of the opioid epidemic started with unlawful prescribing. Right. Not everyone, but that's a pretty large swath of the problem. And one of the reasons people get prescribed opioids is to deal with chronic pain, right? Yes. And throughout the country, there are people who use medical marijuana to treat chronic pain as an alternative to opioids, right? I know a number of states have passed laws, yes, related to medical marijuana. So I guess my question is this. Why has the Biden administration not taken marijuana off the list of Schedule I drugs? So, Congressman, as you, as you know, the president had sent a letter to the secretary of HHS and to the attorney general to, to ask for the scheduling, descheduling process to begin. It's now with uh, HHS. They are in that process. They start, then they send it to DEA. We have not received it yet. That's encouraging. When do you expect to receive that recommendation from HHS? Uh, I have not heard of a timeline from them, um, so I don't, I don't know. Well, that's unsettling, isn't it? I mean, when you don't even know a timeline, it doesn't really make it seem like something's front of mind. We have constant conversations uh, with HHS and with FDA, but we have not been given a specific timeline. W will you leave this briefing and encourage HHS to give you a timeline on getting that information to you? I, I will ask. Thank you. And when you receive the work product from HHS, is there any basis that DEA would have to oppose the descheduling of marijuana as a Schedule One drug? So the way the scheduling process works um, under the law and the regulations is HHS does a review. They then send it to DEA. We then do what is known as an eight-factor review. There's an opportunity for public comment as well. And so we go through that part of the process. And so obviously we, we start with what HHS has provided us. We then go through our own review and a public comment process, and then we come to a scheduling decision. And, and share with me, with the country, what your perspective is on what the outcome of that should be. Well, because I, I couldn't prejudge it at this point in time, I have not seen. Do you have a, do you have a personal view on whether or not marijuana should be a Schedule One drug? As the head of the DEA, I will ultimately be responsible for signing off on will, what the scheduling is. Will you consider is? in the analysis that, that's being done uh, the studies that pretty extensively show that in states, where there is medical marijuana access, there's a lower rate of prescribing these opioids that then can lead to addiction, which then can lead to the, the deaths that we've seen. You have my full commitment, Congressman, that I will keep an open mind. I will look at all the research. I expect that we will get you know, additional public comment or research that comes in, and I will look at all of it. And Mr. Chairman, I'd seek unanimous consent to enter into the record a study conducted by two, H two PhDs, Marie Hayes and Mark Brown, that looked at 
the prescribing of opioids in states with medical marijuana programs and, and indeed found uh, that states with medical cannabis laws had a 24.8 lower mean annual opioid overdose mortality rate. Without objection. Uh, I really hope we get this done. I, it's, we're two years into the Biden administration, and I honestly had hoped that by now we would have already descheduled marijuana from the Schedule One list. Maybe talk to me a little bit about the challenges that DEA has in this patchwork system where marijuana is federally illegal, but then hemp is allowed under the farm bill, and then these, you got people operating under the color of law in all these states. I mean, doesn't that seem like the least effective way to go about this? Uh, if I could speak more generally about our diversion program, um, which is the, the unit that controls all of the scheduling, um, all these questions you're raising, uh, this is an important part of our work at DEA right now is to look at the existing regulations and the existing processes. But it's hard, right? It, it, I just want, you, I want to draw from you the obvious admission that different states having different programs and then the federal government having sort of an, an incongruent regulatory system with the hemp law and Schedule One being maintained, that that is confusing. And we deal with it, Congressman, all the time. Even and it makes it harder, right? The e fact that it's patchwork does probably make the job of DEA agents harder. E even look at xylazine right now, which is something we're having conversations about, is lacing fentanyl. It is, it is certain states have now moved to schedule xylazine. It has yeah. not yet been scheduled in the federal government. So these are challenges we face and, all the time. And I would, and I, would just, I would just also add there's a huge research potential to unlock if we get this right, and I certainly hope that we do. And I, I appreciate your commitment to gild the lily at HHS and get that work product in your hands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, but first, uh, seek unanimous consent to allow the gentleman from Florida, member of the full committee, to participate and have the time waived to him for the subcommittee proceedings. Mr. Chairman, I object. Uh, oh, no, I withdraw the objection. Thank you. Thank you. And the chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Fry. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield my five minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Matt Gates. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, Ms. Scanlon, we just heard my Democrat colleague, Mr. Cohen, say that your circumstance could have been fully resolved if we'd have just had some barriers up in the, sh in the women's showers. Do, do you think that that's a sufficient way to resolve what we're dealing with here? I think by um, Representative Cohen admitting that we need barriers acknowledges there are biological differences between men and women. And by acknowledging that we need to have private spaces that are separate from each other, why can't we just use the locker rooms that we've always used, the men's and the women's? If you're acknowledging that we need protection and privacy from these men, then you're acknowledging that the locker rooms we've always used are the correct ones. My next question is for uh, Shannon Minter. Are you familiar with the changes in law recently in Washington State regarding transgender youth? Uh, yes. And uh, as I understand it, it used to be the case in Washington state that if a youth showed up at an emergency shelter, there was a legal requirement to notify the parent within 72 hours in the absence of some abuse or neglect. Is that your understanding of what the law was then? I believe that is correct. And then the law changed where now in Washington state, if someone shows up to one of these shelters who's a minor, uh, and says that their parents don't agree with them changing their gender, that the shelter no longer has to notify the parents within 72 hours and can instead notify a government authority. Do I have that right? The parents will be notified. There's no question about that. This simply allows for a delay in order to allow them to investigate to make sure this child is going to be safe. There's no question that the parents will be notified. How long should parents have to wait not knowing where their child is while a government process is playing out to make a gender determination? There's no reason to treat these situations with transgender young, pe young people who may be in danger or at risk of 
abuse at home any differently than we would treat any other child where we have reason, reasonable basis to worry about that and to investigate that. But it does a short, treat them differently. A short delay to protect the safety of young people is always warranted. But how long is the delay? How long do you want a parent not knowing where their kid is because the kid says they want to change their gender? Just tell me how long a delay is you, you think is appropriate. I want authorities to treat these kids with the same care they treat all other children. No, but but it, that's will be a, it will be a short delay and the parents will be notified. Hold on, though, notified. because... Well, you, you won't tell us how long a delay. So if you're watching this, just imagine you're that parent and you don't know where your child is. And the law now says there's a 72 hour period where the shelter has to notify you. And that 72 hour period for any child of any gender or any circumstance is a period to investigate whether there's abuse in the home. But beyond that, beyond 72 hours, you gotta tell the parent. And so it's, it's really important to understand here what the uh, proponents of radical gender ideology want. They want to stand between a parent and a child on these important decisions. And I don't think it's abuse if a parent says, I'm not going to get my child gender blockers. And, and it's odd to hear you advocate for the law because just moments ago in testimony, you said, and I wrote it down, parents have a fundamental right to make healthcare decisions regarding their children. But, but if in Washington state today, the parent makes the decision that they're not going to provide that gender affirming care, what it does is it unlocks for the government a window of time to keep the child away from the parent and to not tell the parent where the kid is. Oh, please, get over yourself. What, you know, what, what's terrible is when you have a, uh, this, this incongruent desire of the government to restrain the ability of parents to parent. And I, I can only imagine the terror that a parent must go through not knowing where their child is. So um, I think that's really challenging. We've also seen in the state of Alaska, Title IX, which was established for girls' sports to be used as a justification to socially transition a child against their wishes. Ms. Scanlon, as a beneficiary of Title IX, as a female athlete, do you think Title IX should be used in that way? Absolutely not. Um, swimming did a lot of really good things for my life after I'm a, a, a sexual assault survivor and swimming was one of the only things that I had to keep me going when I was struggling with that. And to think about young girls that are not gonna be given those same opportunities because Title IX is being reworked and rewritten for these new people that have different definitions of what a woman is. Yeah, I'm it's against disturbing. I'm against transitioning children against the will of their parents, and I'm against transitioning Title IX away from an asset for women's sports Mr. to this Chairman. strange social justice cause that is deeply misguided. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, I'd seek unanimous consent to introduce. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and, and I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record. Uh, TexasPolicy.com, how porous borders fuel human, human trafficking in the United States, and also from Heritage, fighting human trafficking and battling Biden's open border. Without objection. Um, Ms. Cohen, I, I think a number of us on the panel took great interest in your description of the screening that doesn't occur at the border. I'd love to give you some time to maybe lend your expertise to the type of screening that, that we ought to really pursue. Thank you so much, Congressman Gates. Um, PACT uh, has, in, has worked very closely with schools, with shelters, with programs around the country to look at indicators of trafficking and red flags. And we are extremely um, eager to engage in working with people at the border, with Customs and Border Patrol, and also with shelters um, we did find it somewhat concerning that shelters were indicated a reluctance to ask questions that might be uh, indicators of trafficking. And just so I know what category that falls in, these are the shelters that unaccompanied minors go to as they're being processed through HHS? We were, we were visiting shelters that had children with family members, and some of the testimony we've heard today has indicated that there is a concern of trafficking among those categories as well. And in those shelters, we were informed that there was not any screening done on children specifically for indicators of trafficking because there was a fear 
of asking questions that might be triggering, that might be problem, problematic for those children. And there are questions that can be asked in a trauma-informed way that could easily assess whether or not the narrative that's being presented is in fact the, the true narrative, the true situation of the child in question. Uh, Chairman Biggs has led delegations down to the border and we've seen the chaotic enterprise that, that exists there. Um, could, could you give us a sense of you know, how long an effective screening could take that was trauma-informed and that was effective at, at, at determining um, you know, if there's a way to uproot some of these networks? I think the, the questioning can be done fairly uh, quickly if there are there's certain indicators that might appear immediately that could, re, could um, lead to additional questioning. But I think that it can be rolled out and we have survivors, our survivors council is very happy actually to provide input. We have members of the survivors council who were trafficked across the southern border who said that no one asked them anything. And that for us is a, a true source of concern, that there should be more focused questioning and just some basic questions about the family dynamics, the family relationship, and to really assess whether what's being presented in some cases by the adults speaking on behalf of the child actually matches up with the child's own testimony. I'd love to draw on your law enforcement experience, uh, Mr. Pizzurro, it, you know, when, when you're able to get that type of real-time data from an effective screening, uh, how can that be useful in, in disrupting these networks? The, the more data that you have, the better the investigation, the better the lead. So uh, it's really important on any information that you can really get, and the challenges with most investigations in, is being in the dark. So. Uh, the more information that law enforcement has to understand where things are going, the more likely we can remedy something. We have all different layers of law enforcement working on this problem. Where have you seen it be most effective? The most effective is, um, just from a trafficking standpoint, is the actual training and the actual, let's say, prioritizing of it. And I think the challenge is it's not really prioritized in law enforcement because we're doing so many different things and I think we're inundated. So I think that's part of the challenge. No, it, it completely is. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, re I reflect back on when we had Steve Friend before us uh, who'd been at the FBI and he had been working some of these cases uh, from a federal level. And when he was reassigned to surveil uh, parents at school board meetings, then no one else picked up those files and, and they just uh, they went by the wayside. So I think, I think you're right that prioritization is probably a, a pretty central to- And, and the that. subject matter, honestly, is that from a law enforcement perspective, it's, it's it, even child sexual abuse material, it's we don't wanna know. So law enforcement generally doesn't really spend that much time doing that. So um, it's, you, it's underfunded, uh, there's less resources and that comes from the agencies itself. No. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Gentleman yields. The gentleman floor is recognized five minutes. I guess I'm just wondering, Mr. Attorney General, has anyone at the department told President Biden to knock it off with Hunter? I mean, you guys are charging Hunter Biden on some crimes, investigating him on, on others. You've got the president bringing Hunter Biden around to state dinners. Has anyone told him to knock it off? Our job in the Justice Department is to pursue our cases without reference uh, to what's happening in the outside world. But just that, yes or no, have you done that? That is what we do. So it's a no? No one that I know of has spoken to the White House about the Hunter Biden case. I'm wondering of course that, not. okay, I got it, I got it. So Hunter Biden is selling art to pay for his $15,000 a month rent in Malibu. How can you guarantee that the people buying that art aren't doing so to gain favor with the president. The job of the Justice Department is to investigate criminal allegations. You have information. Are you investigating this? I mean, someone who bought Hunter Biden's art ended up with a prestigious appointment to a federal position. Doesn't it look weird that he's, making, he's become this immediate success in the art world as his dad is president of the United States? Isn't that odd? I'm not going to comment about any specific Not going to comment, not going to investigate. So right. Hunter Biden associate Devin Archer told us that Hunter sold the appearance of access to then Vice President Biden. Are you confident he has stopped doing that? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Hunter Biden associate Devin Archer told us that Hunter sold the appearance of access to then Vice President Biden. 
Are you confident he has stopped? I'm going to say again that all these matters are within the purview of Mr. Weiss. I have not interfered with them, and yeah, I do not. Yeah, but if you were confident that he had stopped, you could. And I do not intend to us. interfere with yeah, him. I want to. So it was a lot of Chinese money that was working its way through these shell companies into the accounts of the Biden family. So the China Initiative was set up during the Trump administration at the Department of Justice to go after the malign influence of, of the Chinese Communist Party, and the Biden Justice Department dissolved the China Initiative. So I guess I'm wondering, does the department have any documents uh, that would detail the basis for why you got rid of the China initiative that President Trump had set up? The Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division gave a long speech which explained that. He has testified before Congress several times. We'd be happy to provide you with What's the, the basis? Just tell us all now. What, why, why was the China initiative dissolved? What, uh, uh, the, what the Assistant Attorney General said was that we face attacks from four nation states, North Korea, China, Russia, and Iran, and that we need to focus our attention on the broad range of these attacks. Sometimes we but, don't but, but know. Wait a second. You don't, are you saying that North Korea has the same malign influence risk to the United States as the Chinese Communist Party? Are you, are you trying to represent there's some parity there? Because cause here's what it looks like. It looks like the Chinese gave all this money to the Bidens, and then you guys came in and got rid of the China Initiative, and it was successful. Like, I saw one rationale that you guys got rid of the China Initiative because it was racial profiling. But, but one of the people you convicted was a guy named Charles Lieber, who was a Harvard professor taking $50,000 a month to do China's bidding and give them whatever research was being done. Are, are you aware of the millions of dollars that moved through Rob Walker's shell companies from Chinese Communist Party entities into Biden family bank accounts? Are you aware of that? There were a lot of questions that you just asked. Let me start with the first one about North Korea. North Korea is a dangerous actor, both kinetically and with respect to cyber. But not on par with China. I'm on I'm the not, armed services I'm not in the business Attorney right General. now. It's, make, okay, it's, it makes you look you, unserious to suggest may that. May I answer your question or not? Answer the question about whether or not you know about all the millions of dollars that so moved you don't to want Rob me Walker's to answer into. about North Korea? I already know the answer, and so does everyone. They're not the same risk as China. So let's get on to serious questions and serious answers. Do you know about the money that moved through Rob Walker's shell companies, yes or no? As I have said repeatedly, I have left ma these matters to Mr. Weiss. I've not Blissfully intruded, ignorant. I've not interfered, Blissfully I've not to tried things. to find out it's what like he knows. It's like you're looking the other way on purpose it's because everybody knows this stuff's happening. And you know what, people don't pay bribes to not get something in return. Right, we, the, the China initiative resulted in the convictions of a Harvard professor, of someone at Monsanto. So we were working against the Chinese, they paid the Bidens, and now, we're, now you're sitting here telling me that North I'm, Korea is the big threat. I'm I gotta so, get to this one thing on January 6th. I, I, so did the FBI, did the FBI lose not? count of the number of paid informants on January 6th? Let me did answer you? your question about China. I China want you to answer this question, I only get five minutes. You've already you, sort of, I think, screwed the pooch on China. So permitted. January 6th, did you lose count of the number of federal assets? Did you lose count and order an audit? Gentlemen, time has expired. I, I get an answer to the question of did, he, did they lose count? Well, let him answer the question. The time has expired. The, the Attorney General can respond. China is the most aggressive, most dangerous Mr. adversary Mr. that General, the United I think the States faces, and we are doing everything within our power to rebut that, to stop that, to prevent their invasions, both kinetic, both um, and through cyberspace, and we will continue. If, you, to if do someone that. gave that answer in your courtroom when you were a judge, you would tell them they were being non-responsive, and you would direct them to answer the question. Point of order, your Honor. Time is. Adjuring the witness. Point of order. Time is expired. I, I got it. I just. I was. I was. I was. I was. I was. You like your about. Honor? You want to stick with that? Yeah, I, I was getting okay. laughed at you coming, Your Honor. I Point of order either way. Okay, I understand that too. All right. But the gentleman asked his question. Before his time expired, the Attorney General did not respond to the gentleman's question. I was hoping he would respond to the question about the confidential human sources on January 6th. He didn't respond to that. I'm sure we're going to get, uh, we're gonna uh, get uh, an answer uh, to that of, later. Of course, now, Mr. Chairman. There were, there were eight the questions gentleman. before that that he was not given a chance to answer. I understand, so but I, the witness might have thought. But the witness doesn't, Mr. Chairman, point of order. The witness does not control the time. Hang on. Hang on. Exactly right. The members control the time. If they want to switch their question and focus on one more question that they'd like an answer to, I want to give the witness a chance to respond to that final question that Mr. Gates asked. He didn't respond to it. Someone else is going to ask it, I'm sure. We now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee for five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from a 
Florida, Mr. Gates. I think we got him remotely. Is that right? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. I, I regret I'm not there with you in person, and I, I would be, but for some of the ongoing negotiations regarding our, our government funding that we're working through. I want to follow up on where my colleague, Representative Fitzgerald, w was uh, speaking with, uh, with Officer Giannis about the development of witnesses. And I just wonder if what we've seen from prosecutors that uh, don't charge cases appropriately or that plead cases out for minor offenses where, where people who might be violent are back on the streets, does that make it harder to get witnesses to come forward? Uh, do, do the witnesses potentially fear that despite their participation in the criminal justice system, they might uh, be subject to some sort of retaliation? Oh, definitely, 100%. Um, you know, especially with this cash bond, you're, you're going to be releasing offenders, and the first thing their lawyer tells them is there's no victim, no witness, there's no crime. So all they're going to do is retaliate and threaten and at worst maybe kill some of these re victim they're going to basically re-victimize these victims and witnesses so that they don't have to have a trial or court. It's just an astonishing um, amount of testimony that we have a criminal justice system that now the participants in that system are saying re-victimizes the people that we're trying to protect. Uh, I don't believe that the answer to these questions comes out of Washington, but I do think hearings like this are really important because you know we want to get a sense of what some of the early warning signs are in a community like Chicago so that the challenges you face don't metastasize. If you were giving a briefing to another community that had uh, a prosecutor with some of the same theories that uh, the prosecutors have had in Chicago or some of the constraints that a city council might try to put on a police department, what, what would you do to warn other communities about some of the early things that they would want to rebuff so that their streets aren't turned over to the criminals like Chicago's have been? It's very difficult because uh, I would also fear for their safety, you know, so it's like uh, I, um, I can only speak for myself. Like after the incident that happened to me, I had my family and me move out of the city because I just felt it unsafe. Um, I love the city of Chicago and it's a beautiful city. I love the people, the community but I just felt like I couldn't protect my family the way I used to. So if that answers your question. Yeah, I'd love the lieutenant's perspective on that as well. Uh, I, I mean, at the very basis of it is to pay attention to who they're voting for. Uh, it's, it's not just with just one person. It's not just the mayor. It's not just our prosecutor. It's the mayor, the prosecutors, our judges, our legislators, uh, even our aldermen. We've, we have, it's become such a cesspool of, of ill intent. Uh, it, they, they just, it, it, it makes no sense when people are, there are repeatedly voting against their interests. Uh, and and putting people in place that are having such a negative negative impact on our communities, and it just almost appears as though that everybody's somewhat blind to it. Yeah, I mean, it, getting it wrong is different than ill intent. Ill intent makes it seem like the the whole construct of these policies is to end policing, whether it's to take away immunities, to take away policing tools. When you don't allow chase of the bad guys. In Florida, we would think that's like not having police at all because you don't have the ability to bring anyone to justice that may have committed a criminal offense. You know, Mr. Caldwell, you know, you've heard uh, the gentleman sitting next to you, Mr. Giannis, say he's left. Your brother tragically was the victim of a murder, yeah. died. I guess my question to you is, is Chicago savable? Or, or is the city in such a downward trajectory that our only hope is to make sure that these policies don't spread to other places. That's something that I've thought about a great deal since last year. Is Chicago savable? Absolutely, it is savable. I think we absolutely have to unite as a city. And a lot of the leadership that we've seen, Brandon Johnson, as you know, he just got elected into office, but crime is now up 29%, 30%. If the leadership doesn't start changing, if the folks in Chicago don't start voting differently and demanding justice versus becoming numb to what we see as a daily slaughter, 
that we can't get anything done, we can't have movement, but I do believe that the city can be saved and is worth being saved. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, recognize now Mr. Gates for his five minutes of questions. Madam Deputy Mayor, are people more or less safe this year compared to last year in Washington, D.C.? Sorry, I can't say whether they're more or less safe. I can say that crime is up, and so long as anyone doesn't feel safe, then that's an issue for us. Would higher crime rates be one of the more important indicators as to whether or not people are more or less safe? It would be an indicator as to whether or not people feel more or less safe. So it's something that we certainly look at in determining that. I don't know. I think people could feel unsafe even if they were safe. But this doesn't seem to be a delusion, right? Uh, the cases of sexual assault rose 111% over the course of a year. Homicides increased by 38%. Motor vehicle thefts doubled, increasing 106%. Instances of arson, over 125%. And carjackings by 55%. Why do you think that is? There's a host of complex reasons why that's the case. You've heard some. We talk about our ecosystem, policy reasons, right? There do you think are... the soft on crime policies are one reason? I, I don't know that I would say soft on crime policies. What I would say is that there's a number of reforms in policy that have made in the that have been made in the district that we believe need to be adjusted, which is why there's been a number of proposals from the mayor, um, legislation passed by the council to take a look at where we're getting the type in, of in, impact that we don't want. I, I agree with Mr. App that the only way this works is with collaboration. And so, what do you think you would highlight as like the the main uh, policy change that the mayor has proposed that could maybe put some downward pressure on this rising violent crime? Sure, there's a host of um, proposals that the mayor made related to penalty enhancements, to um, aligning uh, penalties for gun crimes with, with federal um, penalties. So there's, there's those, but there's also those on information sharing. So, so, so hold on, let's start with those though. But the underlying premise there is that enhanced punishment can have a deterrent effect and reduce crime, right? We absolutely agree with that, yes. That yeah. accountability is an important part of and I'm definitely not blaming you for this because it's not your job, but when we look at the fact that the prosecutor o over the D.C. area is, has doubled their declinations, the, it, like from your standpoint on the front lines in city government, do you, do you think that doubling the number of declinations um, goes in the right direction or the wrong direction? I would say that what we believe is that if MPD has made arrests, that people need to be held appropriately accountable. We always maintain that. Mayor but, but like you're, that. it seems like the underlying premise of appropriately accountable is to have penalty enhancements. That it's not as if you think people are being held too accountable. It's that they're not being held accountable enough, right? There absolutely needs to be accountability for those who engage in violent crime. I, I think Ms. Richards would probably agree with that. Uh, your your testimony was harrowing, but uh, it could really concern me that people might not be willing to do these life-saving, critically important jobs like firefighting and EMS if they feel like they're going into a war zone. You, you, you gave testimony about what it was like to wait on police as you're trying to save people's lives and help them. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I mean, that's, uh, that's the state that we're in right now. You know, I mean, I've, I've waited in excess of 20 minutes before to try to get MPD on scene for a violent call. What do you do for 20 minutes? We stage and we wait because at this point, we're no longer going in, we're, we're not going to those scenes. And what so happens therefore, to the people And so therefore the citizens help? are not getting treated, right? At, they can't have our services because it's not safe for us to go in there. That sounds like life or death to me, that people could actually die because we don't have enough police to keep even our own first responders safe that want to save people's lives. Is it, it should, I mean, is this, or have you been confronted with these type of life or death situations where people can't get the care they need because you're waiting for, essentially you're waiting for, for firepower and cover to be able to go help people? I can say that, that yes, there's been times where we have to wait and like I said, I've waited personally myself in excess of 20 minutes for MPD to arrive on scene. Yeah, I would observe, Mr. Chairman, that 
DC has some of the strongest gun control laws in the country and uh, increasingly the law abiding people, the people who, who want to be helpful, who want to be good neighbors are constrained by those gun control laws and yet the violent criminals are putting Miss Richards and, and all the people who want to do the good work she does in, in graver danger uh, and that, uh, that might be something worthy of some federal review. I yield back. Gentleman yields chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. I was very heartened by your discussion of site visits to our prisons to get a uh, firsthand understanding of what's going on there. Uh, sometimes members of Congress have had challenges doing that. Could you give us some advice if, if we wanted to glean those benefits and get that firsthand uh, experience? But what's the best way for us to go about that with your team? Thank you, Congressman. So if you have your team reach out to our Office of Legislative Affairs, we will be happy to make that arrangement. Thank you so much. Um, does the Bureau of Prisons retaliate against people based on, political, on, on constitutionally protected speech? I have been very clear that retaliation will not be stood for on my watch. And, and you're confident that that's being observed throughout the Bureau? I'm confident that message has been delivered, and if anyone engages in retaliation, we will hold them accountable. Are you familiar with the matter of John Strand? That name is not familiar to me, no. So Mr. Strand was a witness at a hearing that we had uh, regarding some of the civil rights concerns of people who had interacted with the Department of Justice in January 6 uh, matters. He was convicted, sentenced in his, at FCI Miami, and I had received word that he had been placed into enhanced confinement and into higher acuity uh, secure, securing uh, as a consequence of information that others had put out on his Twitter feed. So is that something you, does that ring a bell to you? Congressman, I wouldn't be able to speak to an individual's um, circumstances regarding their behavior inside our institutions. What I can assure you is that if an individual is placed in our special housing unit, it would be for conduct that happened inside the institution. So is, what's a special housing unit? Is that a special housing unit is one of our uh, restrictive housing placements that could include disciplinary segregation, protective custody, um, and would house individuals that either were at harm to harm their, themselves or others, or had actually engaged in misbehavior inside our institutions. What, what I'm worried about is that Mr. Strand gave us testimony about some of his concerns, and as you know, people give us testimony, we sort through what's right and wrong and should be acted on and shouldn't be acted on. It's not gospel, it's just testimony. Uh, but then thereafter, people were posting on some of his social media platforms his concerns about the treatment he'd received at the Bureau. And then I sent a letter to you concerned about that because like you, I don't want anyone retaliated against for constitutionally protected speech. And, and thereafter, I got a letter back from the aforementioned Office of Legislative Affairs in your office and they say, in part, Mr. Strand was moved to a secure housing unit with increased supervision and frequent employee contact on September 26, 2023, pending completion of an investigation. So I guess my question is, when, when someone, is that like akin to what we would normally think about as solitary confinement? Those words, secure housing unit with increased supervision and frequent employee contact? We would use the word restrictive housing. Okay. So what's this then? Because this guy's a non he was never violent toward anyone, so I'm just wondering why the, the assets that we fund for the highest acuity violent people would be used for this purpose. Uh, Congressman, we use that uh, special housing unit for individuals that um, engage in any sort of misconduct inside our institutions. I don't know what he, he was found to be guilty of by our hearings administrative process that would warrant his uh, need to go into restrictive housing, but I assure you we have administrative processes that people have to go through before those placements actually occur. Yeah, I, I get that. You, you can't know the conditions of every single prisoner throughout the Bureau. This is one I've ripened and sent to you because I am worried that throughout our, DO, our Department of Justice and, and what we've endured, that there are some people who are sort of being used as pawns and they're being mistreated in order to send a message to other people. And I'm grateful that you've said here that is not your doctrine. You don't want to see that happen, but you also haven't been able to share with us an entire confidence that that isn't happening in some cases. And I'm worried that it's, it's happening here. Have you heard of the matter of Owen Schreyer? No, that name is not familiar to Very me. Very similar fact pattern. You know, somebody who'd sort of spoken out, was, was prominent in the public, 
was convicted as a consequence of activities on January 6th, and now feels as though there's specific Bureau of Prison retaliation. I don't think any group of people should be retaliated against, so I look forward to taking you up on the offer to perhaps go in a, and, and do some site visits and, and see how people are being treated and get that information directly. So I, I hope I get prompt cooperation from OLA. I uh, thank the chair and I yield back.